Worst ratings in the country by the health watchdog. The Care Quality Commission said the Trust had to review its performance as a matter of urgency to ensure good quality service. More from Tony Fisher. In its annual A&E patient survey, the CQC listed Milton Keynes in the top ten for emergency provision that was worse than expected. Only last month, health regulator Monitor said the hospital had failed to fully address concerns about both its finances and A&E. The hospital says they've been doing a lot of work to improve patient experience in accident and emergency. Reforms have come into effect for stamp duty announced by the Chancellor George Osborne in yesterday's autumn statement. Estate agents have praised the move, saying it will stimulate the housing market, but Labour has said the Conservatives have no credibility after failing to meet their targets to cut the deficit. Seven people, including three children, were injured in a road crash in Milton Keynes last night. The emergency services were called to Watling Street in Bletchley, near the junction with Wadden Way, after a two-car collision at around 9.45. Firefighters had to release an injured man. Three women, two boys and a girl were also hurt. Hertfordshire singer-songwriter James Bay has landed the Critics' Choice Award at next year's Brit Awards, following the likes of Adele, Ellie Goulding and last year's winner Sam Smith. The 24-year-old from Hitchin will perform at the Brits' nomination party next month and was also part of the Rolling Stones' London concerts last year, as he told BBC Introducing on BBC Three Counties. It was it was Hyde Park. It was, a, I guess, it's kind of a festival atmosphere and it all feels like you know really cool like it would and then you kind of realize that you've got you know the stones are on the same bill when i played like everybody kind of it was at the beginning of the day and everybody just crowded crowded out to the stage and i got an amazing response it was really cool in sport, Chelsea remains six points clear at the top of the Premier League after a 3-0 win at home to Tottenham. Second place, Manchester City won 4-1 at Sunderland. The weather cloudy with outbreaks of rain or drizzle and feeling cold, a maximum temperature 6 degrees Celsius. And you can get the latest news and sport online at bbc.co.uk slash three counties. BBC Three Counties Radio's big tour of beds, hearts and bucks. Well, I think it's the place that has everything. Telling everyone about where you live. I love it. I don't think I'll probably ever move away. All this week, we're discovering Bedford. I love the history of Bedford. I've got a lot of old history books of Bedford. We love it here. We love it. We love the river. We just love everything about it. Yeah, there is a sense of community here. It's very, very good. The big tour of beds, hearts and bucks. BBC Three Counties Radio. We love the river. The river gives us life. Gives us life. It is the life juice from Mother Earth. It's nice, the Bedford River. There's a lovely song there. From Lenny Marlin. What? I can do Terry Wogan. Go on. Do it then. I just did. Oh, OK. Do it again. Oh, it was a lovely song there. Oh, no. Coming oh. up, uh, Helen Dedicott, the voice of the balls. No. <laughs> <laughs> you like that, don't you, Lockers? I think that's a good one. You know what I'm doing here. I'm doing, yeah. I'm doing a Wogan. You're doing a Wogan. Yay. Yeah. Give me something to say in the style of Wogan and I'll say it. Well, you've got the menu. You can do that in the style of Wogan. Coming up on the show today... It's good, isn't it, Lockers? It's, it's borderline <laughs> offensive, what it is. Nurses on the beat in Bedfordshire. <laughs> Hospital misses a beat in Buckinghamshire. It gets harder when he says words I don't know what he said, I've never heard him say. Then Justin Dealey avoids getting beat. <laughs> while getting the word on the street. I've got all golden brown now. <laughs> With his dancing feet. <laughs> There's a lovely song there from Alan Dedicott. <laughs> the voice of the balls. <laughs> I can do Wogan! Across beds, hearts and bucks. This is BBC Three Counties the, Radio. Um, slightly feminine... You're on air. You know you're on air. The slightly yep. feminine, confused... Pairs of headphones for one thing. The slightly confused, feminine northern voice you heard there was, wasn't Catherine Boyle's. <laughs> It's of a higher register. It's certainly not of Kelly Betts, as she's a Cockney. It's of Matthew Lockwood. Good morning to you, Matt. <laughs> I'm just getting back into the swing of things on this programme. Good morning. These He's are not the making right eye contact. He's not headphones. making eye contact. Regular listeners will know that um, Matt is very detrimental to the show's output. And uh, last time he was on, someone texted in asking if he'd won a competition to come and be, <laughs> to come and hang out with us all morning. You know, he's actually a, a professional, paid by your license fees. Isn't that true, Matt? It is. Although it has to be said, he makes most of his money as an Alan Bennett impersonator. Yes, he does. Uh, you? We're not. Uh, the, we're not. <laughs> You're all right. What was that? I just need to clear my throat. Go on then. <laughs> 
Thank you. OK. Uh, we're not... I notice we're not doing the story this morning about your satellite dish. That's a shame. <laughs> We have The way this show works is we have a meeting every morning at about 10.30 that Kath takes and Tony Fisher is rude in, Ooh. and we, um, people throw stories. They don't. Kath comes up with stories. But sometimes people throw stories in. And um, Matt's story was that he's got to move his... He might have to move his satellite dish three foot. And not just me. Many, many people. On one street, there Four. are 19 satellite dishes to move. Oh, good. Mm. He's doing the story. OK, right. So you've got, to, you've got to move your satellite dish, otherwise you lose Sky Atlantic. Possibly. Wow. And he thought that you'd be interested in that. I mean, we are like Boardwalk Empire. It's amazing. I mean, it's a big story, this is. It's a great, it's a great story, Boardwalk Empire. No, it's fantastic. There but are ten they... conservation areas in Watford. They've all had this survey, and all of them have to do I tell you what, maybe something. We, the, the, because of the unique way the BBC is funded by suckers, <laughs> uh, we can put this out to them. Are you interested in Matt's story <laughs> about his sky dish being moved? Is it moving up or down, Matt? Well, it'll have to be moved up. By how much? By about maybe one, maybe two metres, just below the roof line. At the moment, it's in the middle of the property, just above... If you're interested in Matt's boring story about his Sky satellite dish, then do give us a call, 0845... What? It's not boring. 08459 455 555. It's a god-awful small affair To the girl with the mousy hair But her mummy is yelling no her daddy has told her to go But her friend is nowhere to be seen Now she walks through her sunken dream To the seat with the clearest view And she's hooked to the silver screen But the film is a sad thing for For she's lived it ten times or more She could spit in the eye Oh, that's the funniest thing I've ever read in my life. Thank you, thank you so much. It's on a merry cast orchard brow That Mickey Mouse has grown up a cow and now the workers have struck for fame Cos Lennon's on sale again See the mice in their million hordes From Ibiza to the north of Broads Blue Britannia is out of bounds To my mother, my dog and clowns But the film is a sad thing for Cos I wrote it ten times or more It's about to be writ again As I ask you to focus on Morning, this is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. I do apologise. We, we have an internal communication system here and um, oh, and sent a very powerful message on it. <laughs> very powerful. Oh, Now, mental health nurses are going out on the beat with Bedfordshire Police. Uh, with Bedfordshire Police, it's part of a host of new measures combating the rising tide of police incidents involving mental health. Well, currently that figure stands at one in four. We can speak now to GP Dr. Judy Baxter, who the uh, clinical, who is the clinical director for mental health services in Bedford. Bedfordshire. Good morning, Judy. Tell us more about this agreement. Oh, good morning. 
Um, yes, yesterday was a very exciting day for Beveridge and Luton um, for, for, um, in the world of mental health um, because we um, got all the organisations together who um, um, helped to provide services for people in a mental health crisis and um, they signed the local Mental Health Crisis Concordat, um, agreeing to work together to try and improve services for, for people. Is is it in response to a Bedfordshire specific problem, Judy? No, this is a national um, initiative. Um, the government um, published their crisis care concordat in February, and, um, and they asked everybody to work on a local agreement um, before the end of December, so that we could all sign up and, and agree to work together. So, why is it needed? What what what, what instances have, have we heard of? Um, well, it is thought it's a national scandal um, how um, mental health patients and well, people who are experiencing a crisis how how they are treated. Um, it, it really should be treated in the same way as a, a physical health um, emergency, like chest pain or um, if you're short of breath. Um, when, in a crisis, it's really, it really should be a, a considered a serious um, p- um, problem and um, and should be. I mean, it can be life threatening, um, and people do unfortunately sometimes die. Um, and, but what happens is people are taken to um, too often. They're taken to a police cell to wait. Um, and um, they often have to wait for hours and hours in, in A&E to be seen. Um, so really it's felt that, that a lot of work um, should be done. In actual fact, in Bedfordshire, we had already started to do work and there have already been improvements made. Um, but the benefit of this concordat is that we'll, um, there'll be a higher priority given to it um, and we'll perhaps make a bit more progress. So, so what, what are the changes? Is it better education for the police? I mean, there, there was a story uh, either this week or last week, wasn't there, of a, of a young woman held in a police cell because uh, she was mentally ill but there was no beds for her. Would, would, would that kind of uh, incident come under this remit? It, it Yes, yes. And unfortunately, that does happen, that people are... That's well, quite to, common, isn't it? It is, yeah. yes, yes. Although it has reduced, um, I believe, um, it, it has reduced by a third in Bedfordshire because of the work that's being done um, with between um, the police and our mental health provider, SEPT. Um, but it and that's not happen. the police's fault, is it? That, that's lack of resources within the, 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 the mental health sector. It is, yes, yes. I mean, it's a difficult, it is difficult. Um, we can't have people sort of waiting around just in case somebody comes along, um, you know, that we haven't got the resources to do that. So it, it's a matter of rearranging how we work and making sure that we, we um, see people better. We probably need to, to make arrangements to, to, um, to make a better place for people to be taken. Um, but these things are quite difficult to work out and obviously there isn't extra money, no. so we have to work out, we have to save money elsewhere to make the new um, arrangements work. The declaration has been signed, Judy. How, how long do we know if it's, before it's been successful or not? Um, well, we've, <clears throat> we've signed the, the, the declaration, which is a commitment, um, and we're now working on the action plan together of, of all the different things we need to do. And it's actually, we started the work yesterday after the um, signing event, um, and there are so many different bits to it. So it's going to be, um, take some time to sort of come towards um, uh, deciding exactly what's the, the best thing to do. Mm. And we need to do that by March. And then we made a commitment yesterday that we want to hold another event in six months to see where we've got to. Um, and, I, and I know, I mean, this is a national initiative. Mm. We keep being chased um, from, from the centre. So we know that we, we will be um, being asked, you know, what have we achieved? What have we done? And also we're all really keen to make a difference and make it better for people. Judy, are you normally up at this ridiculous time of the morning? <laughs> you sound very perky. <laughs> No, no, I'm not, no, but it's something I feel very passionate well, about, so... We really appreciate you, you, you getting up extra early for us. Thank you very much. Nice to talk to you. OK, thank you very much. Let's talk to Judy Baxter. Clinical Director for Mental Health Services in Bedfordshire. It's funny, isn't it, Catherine? That was that story... <clears throat> I don't know, I get, I've lost track of time if it was this week or last week of that young woman who was held in a police cell, I think, for three nights, two nights, two three nights? Two nights, I believe. Uh, because there was no... Um, it was in Devon, I think. I'm kind of clutching at my mental straws here. Uh, because there was nowhere for her to go, and uh, the police had to come out and kind of make a big fuss about it and say, we've got this woman, what are you going to do about yeah, it? Yeah, police officer tweeted about <clears> it, didn't he? But it was odd that it, it, it became such a big story, because this happens, I want to say all the time, but it happens a lot of, of people with mental health issues. There are, there are no beds for them, so they, get, they stay in police cells. And there's also the point that that people are dealing with mental health issues on their own mm. and they only get picked up on because they commit some sort of crime. Yeah. They become a, a, you know, a pain to, to someone. Do you remember we did that story about um, flashing and how we should take it more oh, seriously yeah, yeah, yeah. and how you know people sort of laugh and joke about it but actually it's something that needs dealing with. Yeah. And we had a phone call shortly afterwards from that person's sister yeah. who said that 
He was um, dealing with uh, acute schizophrenia at home. He'd become a bit of a pariah in his tower block where he was living. Not to justify his behaviour, but no, saying that if this that had been acted on earlier, she then... She said that he acts out and then he gets attention, she no. said, but otherwise he's just left to his own devices and she was really worried about him. <sighs> Thank you, Catherine. 08459 four double five five double five. BBC Three Counties Radio. Let's get the travel, shall we? Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. On the M1 southbound, there's been an accident just after Junction 10 for the Luton Airport Spur Road involving three cars, so that is blocking two lanes at the moment, making it very slow past their southbound on the M1. Having a look at the A1M, that's moving fine at the moment on the speed sensors and no problems at the moment on the M25, but on the North Circular Road, it's starting to build up westbound between the Clockhouse Interchange and Bounds Green Road. Having a look on the trains and Great Northern services have 25-minute delays between Stevenage and King's Cross. That's because of a signal failure earlier on at Finsbury Park. And on Thames services there are delays uh, because of a signalling problem as well. On the London, Mid- London Midlands trains there is a re- replacement bus service running between Watford Junction and St Albans Abbey that's for engineering works and that will be going on until the end of December. Smart the Breath BBC Three Counties Radio Blimey 6.17 it's uh, Thursday the 4th of December I'm Ian Lee these are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio nurses trained in mental health issues are being deployed alongside Bedfordshire police officers police in Bristol searching for a missing mother and her newborn baby have found a woman's body an accident and emergency at Milton Keynes Hospital has received one of the worst ratings in the country by the health watchdog BBC Three Counties Radio Every weekday from three. Good afternoon, welcome to the show. Local people. What's your story? It seems there's a law for them and then there's one for the press. And I disagree with what they're saying. Local views. In some cases, sort of 40% loss in value of their properties. Has Kevin Luton got it right? There is a responsibility when you're paid from the public purse. Local life. Do you want to know how much my carer's allowance goes up by every April when the tax year changes? Two quid. Roberto Peroni. And is it fair to target people on? On benefits. Weekdays from three. BBC Three Counties Radio. Boyle joins me in the studio. I'm assuming that's to get away from uh, wandering hands lockers. Not at all. Do you know what? He smells really nice today. And I said, oh, you smell good. And you went, yeah, I've had a wash. Have a sniff of that. Oh, no, please. Have a sniff of that. Oh. Do you know what that is? That's the smell oh. of a... F- Sorry? I wasn't talking to you. That's the smell of a 15-year-old boy. Yeah. Lynx Apollo. I kind of liked it. Yeah, Lynx Apollo, ladies and gentlemen. It's it, it the spoke only... to my 15-year-old girl. Didn't it just, though? That, I mean, people knock uh, Lynx, but flipping it, it was all I had today. I wish I had Africa. That's the smell. It really sums up the uh, <laughs> essence of the uh, the continent of Africa. All I've got is Apollo, which smells like a space mission. But I smell good. <laughs> oh, yeah. Matt, you are going to say something. Mm. OK, now you're not. He just smells clean. <clears throat> Matt, smell clean. Matt, we've discovered, pays more for his haircut than me, and I pay <laughs> a lot for my haircut. Yeah, but it's, it's once in a blue moon, every once every four months. So, you what? Know, 40 quid every once every four months is nothing, is you it? spend more on your hair than I do. Yeah, that's yeah. well. I, that's got pretty, more hair than I pretty obvious, Elliot. I get a head massage as well, and I get a cup of coffee and a nice biscuit, and the chat to me, and, okay, you know, nice. it's like a day out. Oh, okay, nice biscuit. Do you know yeah. what I've got? A recliner seat. You know when they wash your hair? Yeah. yeah. Like, do you want uh, legs up and a massage? Yes, I do. Yeah. I always regret it, though. Because that chair that oh, they've got, man. it's got, like, little nodules in oh, it. The, the massage chairs are rubbish. And all it does is kind of annoy. Yeah. And it concentrates a lot on the backside. Mm, they're too short, because I have to go like this, literally, when I'm having my head. <laughs> no one no one is comfortable with the old uh, the, the sinks where you put your head back. and have no. your, no. They're not... Co- uh, is that warm enough? Uh, yeah, it'll do. But they, they really hurt your neck, and I'm constantly tense in that position. Do you know what would be better? Go on. What my mum used to do, which was uh, get you to stick your head over the bath. Yeah, yeah I'll do that. And then she'd plug in the, the <laughs> yeah, adapters rubbish. on the tap, and yes. then you'd get like a little shower. Old-fashioned shower. Take notes, salons. Yeah, take notes, salons. Take notes, salons. All right, mate, we said that. In your face. All right, steady on. Let's not on get your head. offensive. Hey, guess who's on uh, Guess who's on Radio 4 tonight? Uh, on Front Row, the arts programme. The arts. Catherine a... Boyle. No! No, they've not woken up yet. Oh, There's yeah. a T in that word. Front row, oh. Radio 4, the arts programme. Mm. Guess who's on it, Lockers? Uh, Justin Deary. No! Me? 
No! I think you'd be really good on it. It's who? Roberto. No, it's me. I'm on there reviewing a karate film. Uh, Simon Oxley? No, it's me. I'm on there reviewing a karate film on Radio 4. Tim Wheeler. Right, stop that. Small faces, get yourself together. Ian McLagan, the keyboard player, died. I like the small faces. I like the small faces. They're one of the kind of uh, undervalued groups of, uh, well, I believe the 1960s, the swinging 60s, mm. I believe they're called. And how can a decade be described as swinging when people still had outside toilets? And a bath once every fortnight. Oh, dear, dirty. Oh, I used to have a bath once a week. Sunday night was bath night. How weird is that? Dirty, dirty 70s. We had stuff to do. Now, Empty in the coal bunker. Yeah, that would be it. We had a coal bunker. I used to dance on the granddad's coal bunker. I used to like... It. Oh, excuse me. Sw- what was that? That was... Uh, oh, oh. oh, that's uh, Scott, can you stop texting me? I'm doing a radio show, mate. Scott. Time and a place, Scott. The care... I used to like it when the coal man would come, because a big uh, truck would pull up, and then he'd come marching through the house, filthy, and dump the coal off. Do you know what I liked? When the pop man came. We, we didn't have a pop man. Yeah, pop man. Yeah, well, that was up north, isn't it? Yeah. That was like the 1930s. Mm. Now, the Care Quality Commission is urging Milton Keynes Hospital to take action after putting its accident and emergency on a list of underperformers. Milton Keynes is seventh in the roll call of ten casualty departments doing worse than expected nationwide. Now, when it says seventh out of ten, because they're the worst ones, is number ten the worst no, one number or number one. one is the worst one. one? Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Management has been told to review its performance as a matter of urgency. Uh, Catherine Boyle has been looking into this. What more does the CQC say? Well, they compiled a national patient survey which polled patients who used A&E departments across England and Wales between January and March 2014. So this is recent stuff. It looked at arrival, waiting times, the doctors and nurses, care and treatment, environment and leaving. Milton Keynes finished seventh on a list, as you say, of trusts whose scores were graded worse than expected. The CQC stated that those trusts on the list have to review their performance as a matter of urgency to ensure they deliver good quality A&E services across the areas included in this survey. Now, what's been the reaction from the Patients Association? Well, Dr Mike Smith from the organisation sympathises, saying A&E departments are under pressure and if you're one of the 600,000 patients waiting longer than 24 hours for treatment, it's a disaster. He says things aren't helped by the fact that nurses to patient ratio has gone down from one to eight, but it's the level of trust in the doctors and nurses which is the most worrying. 
And here's some audio that we've got. If you look, for instance, at uh, the report, although they say, you know, it's positive that uh, th- three out of four uh, definitely had confidence and trust in the doctors and nurses, but what about the other 25% who don't? If one in four don't, that's, that's serious. Uh, and it's points like that in that uh, the report endeavours to be positive because, in fact, fortunately, the majority of people are still saying quite good things. But if you compare it even with 20 or 30 years ago, you'd have had 100% saying they definitely had confidence and trust in the doctors, virtually 100%. Milton Keynes Hospital came in for criticism recently, didn't it? Yeah, just last month, health regulator Monitor said the hospital had failed to fully address concerns about both its finances and its A&E department. Monitor said they must develop a plan to ensure patients don't wait longer than four hours to be seen at A&E. Uh, And what does uh, Milton Keynes Hospital have to say? Well, we've had a statement through from uh, the Deputy Chief Nurse and Head of Quality, Jane Naish. She says making sure patients feel listened to, well-informed, valued and respected as as individuals is really important to us and it's clear to see that we have improvements to make. We've been doing a lot of work to improve patient experience in A&E, including investments to improve the space and facilities available to help us continue to improve and make sure patients have the best experience possible in our A&E department and across the hospital. We're also asking patients to give us their ideas as to how we can make their time with us as positive as it can be now as we know health services across Bedford and Milton Keynes are currently being reviewed with the possibility that one site will see a significant downgrade of A&E services yeah. although Milton Keynes currently has plans for a new £21 million A&E department the government said it won't make any decisions until that Milton Keynes Bedford review is completed Across beds, hearts and bucks This is Ian Lee BBC Three Counties Radio Can I, um, I heard an amazing thing on, uh, what's that radio station called? Five Live. Yes. Uh, and it, it, it was um, the Autumn Statement yesterday. I hope, did you, did you enjoy watching the Autumn Statement, Matt? Okay. I learned a new term, masosadism. <laughs> I've no idea what it is, but it sounds naughty. Sounds like a lot of fun, dear. Um, the Autumn Statement yesterday, which, let's be honest, no one really understands. We all pretend we're excited about, but no one understands it and no one really cares. The bit I picked up on was um, they're getting rid of stamp duty. But then they're putting stamp duty up for hi- more expensive houses. Yeah, but we'd have to worry about that. Here's the thing. I know somebody who, sold, who had a house, this is a, a friend of mine, uh, sold their house for a million pounds, right? But the threshold... For stamp duty is a million pounds. So if you go over a million pounds, you have to pay a lot more stamp duty. So they sold their house for nine hundred ninety-nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine pounds and ninety-nine pence. Yeah. And then ten thousand pounds was exchanged in a brown envelope. Wow. So that's what happens if you put the stamp duty up. Then people find ways around it. That's why they're um, richer than me. That would explain it. Uh, but there was, I, I just want to play a clip of this. This was, this was um, uh, the, the, the Commons yesterday. I call the Shadow Chancellor, Mr. Ed Balls. Yeah. Okay. Oh. The, um, the, the, uh, yeah, come on, guys. Guys? Guys? These? It's a room full of Tony Fishers. <laughs> order! 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 This is... Order. Thank you. This is what the meeting is like first thing in the morning yeah. if Tony Fishers in the room. But the, I, I, I'm, those are the people running the country, right? Yeah. Those are the people who I have been arguing deserve more money. Yeah. Don't sound like the kids on the back of the bus at school. If we did that at school, we would get a wallop. Out! Boyle, out! Mm? Lee, out! Then we'd be out in the hallway together. Awesome. Then we could mess but around even get, more. But you get told off and I wouldn't. One no. time I got sent no. out, the headmaster came down the corridor. No. started to worry. No. He assumed I was there on some sort of uh, obvious business because no. I was such a good girl. I couldn't possibly be in trouble. So we had a little how, chat how did and you he went become, on his way. Uh, how did you become her girl? Popular vote. Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. On the M1 southbound, there are three lanes closed now because of an accident just after Junction 10 for the Luton Airport Spur Road. And it was completely closed a moment ago, so they have reopened uh, one of the lanes. It's causing queues to Junction 11 for Dunstable Road at the moment. Having a look at the M25 anti-clockwise, and that is starting to build up between Junction 21 for the M1 and 20 for Kings Langley. And in Bricketwood on the North Orbital Road, it's looking very heavy around the M25 Junction 21A roundabout. On the trains, Great Northern have 25-minute delays between Stevenage and Kings Cross because of a signalling problem at Finn. Park and on Abellio Greater Anglia services, there are delays between Hartford East and Broxbourne, and that's because of a points failure at Ware. Samantha Braff, BBC Three Counties Radio. 
across beds, hearts and bugs. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. It's 6.30, I'm Simon Oxley. Nurses trained in mental health issues are being deployed alongside Bedfordshire Police Officers. Police and Crime Commissioner Ollie Martin says it's one of many new measures they're introducing across the county. Police searching for a missing mother and her newborn baby have found a woman's body. Charlotte Bevan walked out of a hospital in Bristol on Tuesday evening. Her daughter is still missing. Accident and emergency at Milton Keynes Hospital has received one of the worst ratings in the country by the health watchdog. And Hitchin singer-songwriter James Bevan has landed the Critics' Choice Award at next year's Brit Awards following the likes of Adele, Ellie Goulding and last year's winner, Sam Smith. Three Counties Sports. BBC Three Counties Radio. Chelsea remain six points clear at the top of the Premier League after a 3-0 win attempt to Tottenham. Second place Manchester City won 4-1 at Sunderland with Sergio Aguero scoring twice. Arsenal beat Southampton 1-0 with a last-minute goal from Alexis Sanchez. His manager, Arsene Wenger. Well, it was a difficult game against a good side, but overall I think we deserved to win. It was a victory of uh, patience, intelligence, and uh, we kept our structure well. And overall, uh, it is an important win against a good side. And Everton and Hull drew one all. Luton have sold their extra allocation for the Boxing Day trip to Wickham, meaning over 2,600 Hatters, meaning over 2,600 Hatters fans will be at Adams Park. And Luton's home game with Portsmouth two days later is also now a sellout. Meanwhile, with no game this weekend, Steve Nidge are holding an open training session for fans at their Bragbury End training ground on Saturday morning. England's cricketers won the rain-affected third one-day international in Sri Lanka by five wickets under the Duckworth. Lewis method. They now trail 2-1 in the seven-match series, but captain Alistair Cook is facing a suspension if England are found guilty of a slow overrate. There will be a record 21 Formula One races next year, compared to 19 this year. The Korean Grand Prix returns with a new race in Mexico. The British Grand Prix at Silverstone is on July the 5th. And a report out this morning says the Tour de France's visit to the UK this summer was watched by 4.8 million people and generated around 100 £28 million. Pounds. BBC Three Counties News and Sports. The next full bulletin is at seven. Call 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. That's not uh, your radio breaking. That's actually a BBC employee. What's his job description? Who, who was that? Uh, that was Matt Lockwood, who's filling in for Kelly Betts. Who's well, filling in for, you know, nobody... What, oh, wow. What's his job title? Um, Is he a BJ? To assist. I'm assisting you this so morning. So you're a BA? Yeah, this morning. Uh, what are you normally, a BJ? BJ. I've gone down one. Were you laughing at I'm a BJ as well? <laughs> gone down. I'm now a BA. Do you guys not know what you're saying? You're both BJs? Yeah. Uh, it's not funny. My girlfriend says that to me all the time. She thinks it's hilarious. You're a BJ. Oh. I was going to start a cover band. You're a BJ. Yeah. A bit of the BJs called the BJs with a colleague. I oh, yeah. thought it was funny. It's not. Well, it is funny, but you know what? Do you know? Do you know why it's funny? Yeah, broadcast journalist. Okay. Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. So when you hear um, uh, people in the House of Commons doing this, the shadow chance not Mr. this. Ed Balls. Yeah. Do you not? Do you not just think, flipping it? You idiots are running the country. In any other environment, you get the boot. And this is this is what they do. The House has not yet seen the detailed... Order! Order! order. And fair play, Ed, Ed Balls is not the greatest speaker anyway. You know what that is? <clears throat> Go on. That's a room with not enough women in it. That's well, what happens. You, you lot run amok. It's Bance. It's Bance gone wild. Oh, dearie me. I, I, I think... 08459 oh, 455 555. Does anyone else think that's the most ridiculous noise in the world? Hey, should we play a good song? Yeah, go on. A uh, bit of Matt Munro? Yeah. Right, so Matt Munro, he was a milkman, uh, and um, then he became like a crooner because someone heard him singing a song and they thought, oh, fair play, he's all right. But uh, it kind of in the 60s, he wasn't particularly hip. So I'm just trying to find it. That's why I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm put it Are down. you playing Born Free? No. Uh. That's exactly what I'm not playing, uh. right? So he, uh, uh, he was trying to become a bit hip, so he recorded a protest song. Protest songs are in. Yeah. Right, but he's not quite understood the protest movement. Shirley 
would go down her breakfast, shut the fridge and join the throng. Margaret Beatty snatched the milk and scanned the news and went along. Annie Harris drew the curtain, screwed her eyes up, had a beep. Saw the marchers, heard their voices making early morning noises. Stumbled back to bed and tried to sleep. Shuffling through the cold black morning Went the marcher's spirits low Grunting greetings, grimly pressing On to where they had to go When the sun came up they brightened Stopped to have their thermos brew Annie Harris got up gladly Bonded for a little sadly Then got on with what she had to do So come with us, run with us Target numbers swollen, up the marchers, banners go, chanting, shouting out with leaflets, protest for everyone to know. Sit in front of all the traffic, Harry busy shopping wives, try to stir their ostrich notions, whip them up to wild emotions, put some fire into their wretched lives. Sitting by a policeman from the road Margaret Beatty had her face slapped by a man she tried to goad Annie Harris in the office Paused in typing, thought of Don Glanced again at his last letter Died for others to live better Brushed away a tear and carried Jolly, isn't it? It's jolly. Has anything really changed? Has anything really changed? It could be singing about today. See, that's the soundtrack in Russell Brand's mind. Yeah. What are you doing, Matt? You could make cakes to that song, actually. It's nice when you could, you know, put your sugar in, put your eggs in. OK, thank you very much Gosh. indeed. I mean, the <laughs> thing is, that's all real. That's all He's not real. doing a voice. <clears throat> what have you got in the papes? The lesbian couple who kissed in the Royal Festival Hall were the is wrong... That, is that a euphemism? Uh, no, it's a place. Oh, yeah, South Bank. This is the lesbian couple who were ordered to stop kissing during a meal at the Royal Festival Hall because they were in a family restaurant. Hey. Do you remember when we did um, the two gay guys kissing on a bus? Yep. There were no pictures of them, were there? No. Um, do you remember when we did the lesbians who kissed in the uh, supermarket? supermarket? Yep. There was a picture there, wasn't oh, there? Oh, yeah, yeah. There's a picture of both of them here so hey. we can imagine the scene. I imagine that's what they're doing it for. Yeah. Lydia Coulson, 29, on the left, said she gave partner Ruby Jones, 30, a kiss on her cheek and a peck on the lips at the what, canteen. What were their ages? Uh, 29 and 30. Okay, that's fine. It's odd to find a couple so close in age, isn't it? Mm. Normally there's a few years disparity. Um, no. Okay. I think my mum and dad are about three months apart. Well, that's weird. Mm. Okay. Works, though. Works for them. Are they lesbians? No. Okay, I'm just trying to get a correlation. and well, maybe we're, um, My dad I'm... likes girls. Okay. 
Lydia Corson, 29, left, said she gave her partner Ruby Jones, 30, a kiss on her cheek and a peck on the lips of the canteen of London's South Bank before a member of staff demanded they stop what you are doing. A shocked Miss Jones challenged her by saying, is it a family restaurant or a homophobic restaurant? The canteen subsequently apologised, leading cabaret artist Miss Jones to add, they mess with the wrong lesbian. Yay. Go, girl. The couple are now working with the restaurant to organise an event to raise awareness oh. of homophobia. Oh. Good. Well... Well, well, no, need to, no need to have an event. I, mean, I know, but flipping it. Kiss who you want. But the Royal Festival Hall is quite uh, artsy fartsy. Yeah, you would, you would think... have thought they'd, be, they'd love that stuff. And it's in swinging London. Yeah. Um, laugh sentence caught in hysterics as posh lawyer translates slang. Oh. A court was left in hysterics after a barrister tried to translate slang texts for the jury yesterday. <sighs> Mark Paltengi, who is in his 50s, had jurors in stitches with his explanations of the messages sent by four youths accused of shooting at houses with an air rifle. Okay. One text which read, Hurry up, I've got bear haters around me now, was translated by the prosecutor as, Hurry up, I've got a lot of people who don't particularly like me here. (laughs) (laughs) He told Snaresbrook Crown Court in East London that, Hurry up, I've got a strap on me, this is bear bait, meant, Hurry up, I've got a gun on me, and this is really, really risky. (laughs) Oh, bless him. I like it when things have to be explained in court by um, posh people completely out of touch with the the real world. I had a very posh English teacher and we liked it the other way around when he would talk to us in slang, but oh. in his usual voice like this. Yes. Yes. I don't. You, you, you do a bit of slang, do you, Matt? Yeah, I like the expression, I'm going to smack that, which means I'm going to really do good at that. So I'm going to smack <laughs> that exam or smack that wherever. Yeah. <laughs> I can't. Is that northern? Oh, it's been a while since... No, that's down south, that is. That's, okay. you know, London town. The street. Oh, he's yeah. doing the finger thing. Yeah, I'm going to smack that in a minute. Yeah. And what I mean is I'm going to smack your face. Oh. I'm going to punch your face. I'm going to punch your face. I'm going to punch your face. Let's, and look, Let's and then, not yeah. have any punching, boys. I'll Come punch on. punch you in the face. You see, he's got previous. <laughs> I'll punch you in the face. Yeah. And he's got previous on this. Ay, 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 like your corn cannot. Oh! Ay, 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 I think you're great. Tell us about your holiday. It, um, Matt went to possibly the uh, most hilariously titled resort um, I've ever heard of. Where'd you go, mate? No, it wasn't. There was Villa de Palma. You told me it was Club Coco Bongo. No, that's the other thing. That's, that was a night out. You went to Club Coco Bongo <laughs> for a <laughs> night out? What, yes. What the hell happens there? Well, basically, it's like a, a nightclub, or a yeah. club, as you say. I'm so old-fashioned. A disco. I'm only at 30 years old, Jesus. Um, and, sorry for uh, that language, by the way, for anyone who doesn't like blasphemy. Oh, yeah. yes, sorry about that. Which yes. is the majority. For, for God's sakes, man. This is worth Stop it! Um, and, and basically, they have a stage in the club, and they, they play film clippets, and clippets, snippets, and then the dancers dance... And so they had a, a, a snippet of a Captain America film, and then there were Captain America and the evil baddie, and they were just fighting, play mock fighting. He never didn't tell us any of this when he came into the uh, office. Instead, he showed us video of all the women stripping off. Yeah, as nurses. That was how that story went. What else have you got in the papers? Um, oh, oh. Men, men are changing shape. Oh, yeah, go on. As is their won't. Men are now taller, stronger, healthier and fatter, yes, fatter, than they were in the 50s, research reveals. 50s man was a a sturdy beast, wasn't he? Yeah. Sort of triangular. Yeah. Big shoulders, small waist. In 1954, the typical British male was just over five foot seven, which is a very reasonable height to be. Yeah. Weighed 11 stone six and had a chest of 37 inches and a waist of 34. He wore size seven shoes, had a collar size of 14 and a life expectancy of just 68. I'm sure Dennis in Dunstable is sitting there thinking, yeah, that's me, that's me to a T. But today, Mr Average is five foot nine, weighs 12 stone six and has a chest of 42 inches and a waist of 37. That's um, diet, that. It's, it, well, but we, we and get, lifestyle. We get taller, don't we? I met a fella the other night who was taller than me. I love it. I love meeting people who are taller than me. Mm. It gives me a, a little glimpse as to what it's like to be normal. Which circus were you at? I wasn't. It was. I was out. I was out and about, and he he turned up. You seen this video of this um, fella? He pretends he's. I mean, uh, he pretends he's killed his son for a laugh. Always hilarious. It's what it is. Is 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 a mum and dad playing on a balcony on, on the upstairs? And the boy's dressed up as, super, as Spider-Man. The mum goes downstairs. He swaps the son for a dummy. And as she comes upstairs, he throws him over his shoulder, over the balcony. 
Now, you're trying not to smile. I'm not, because I, I know that this story, and I didn't watch it because I thought, what a prat. A dad plays a vile prank on his girlfriend who thinks he's held their little boy to his death. That's not... It's a bit stupid, prank. isn't it? Prank, I mean prank. Yeah. Prank is, oh, I've pulled his arm off. Not, oh, I've lobbed him over the balcony. She rages at the dad. I hate you. Why would you do that? And that pretty much sums it up, doesn't it? Yeah. I hate you. Why would you do that? That's weird. Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. Travel news for beds, cards, and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. On the M1 southbound, there are three lanes closed just after Junction 10 for the Luton Airport Spur Road after an accident involving three cars. Those queues are still to Junction 11 for Dunstable Road, but it's also starting to look very busy on the approach to the M1 on the airport way and also on the A5 southbound through Dunstable 2. Having a look at the M25 and anti-clockwise, it's looking very busy between Junction 21 for the M1 and 20 for Kings Langley. And in Brickettwood, the North Orbital Road is very busy around the M25 Junction 21A roundabout. On the trains, Great Northern, I've resumed a normal service again between Stevenage and King's Cross after the, sig- the signalling problem but on the Bellio Greater Anglia services there are delays between Hartford East and Broxbourne because of a points failure at Ware Samantha the Bruff, BBC Three Counties Radio Thank you very much indeed 6.46, it's Thursday the 4th of December, I'm Ian Lee, these are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio Nurses trained in mental health issues are being deployed alongside Bedfordshire officers. Police in Bristol searching for a missing mother and her newborn baby have found a woman's body. An accident and emergency at Milton Keynes Hospital has received one of the worst ratings in the country by the health watchdog. Uh, We'll speak to Justin Dealey in a bit. Let's get the weather. Here's Alina. Beds, hearts and bucks weather. BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning to you, Ian. A cloudy, cold day. The cloud thick enough to give some light rain and drizzle at times, but damp rather than overly wet. But any brightness is certainly going to be limited by the extent of the cloud. And quite a raw feel to the day, a high of 6 Celsius, 43 degrees Fahrenheit. Still cloudy tonight and still thick enough in places to give some light rain and drizzle. But with all the cloud cover, it will keep temperatures above freezing at around 1 or 2 Celsius. Still cloudy tomorrow morning, another grey, dull start to the day with some light rain or drizzle. But it is an improving picture through the day. As a cold front pushes its way south and eastwards behind it, some brighter skies and perhaps a bit of sunshine to end the day. But under clear skies overnight tomorrow, we'll see a cold and frosty start as we go into Saturday morning. But Saturday will be dry with plenty of sunshine and that's your weather. Your world. It's full of the things that are important to you. The main reason the hospital's full to bursting is that so many more of us are living longer, getting more poorly, suffering complex problems and taking longer here to recover. From what's plain to see to what's beneath the surface. Now this is one area which has been highlighted as being a drug hotspot. And it wasn't the more you know about your world, the closer you feel to it. There's a commercial oven and a table that have drifted past us on this water. They've come out of the ruptured cafe down here. At the Your local news the matters on BBC Local Radio, TV and online.
Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. Catherine Boyle is here. Yeah. Hey. Hello. Uh, Justin Dealey is there. Bonjour. Oh, oh. oh, he's speaking for us. Yeah. Dino. Oui, oui. Oh, oh, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> He, he, he said that. He said the same joke that a three-year-old might do. <laughs> well done, Justin. You're right. Yeah, I'm all right, boss. How did your, uh, your your fellow yesterday, Chris, came in who who mm. bid ridiculously? I mean, I, 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 we met him, and he didn't look like a, a drug addict or anything, <laughs> or a lunatic. He bids uh, six hundred and twenty quid. Yep. To come in, to go out on the, the streets with you. <laughs> and yesterday, boy, wasn't yesterday cold? It was freezing. Yeah. So he's bid six hundred pounds to come out onto the streets, and this Saturday between twelve and two, he'll be co-hosting my program. I've got a say he knows his stuff yeah he, he was poning really you mate does. when we met him he was poning you he, he was he was yeah. he's very very keen yesterday morning he was running up to people saying hi i'm from three counties right whoa 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 chris chill out chill out <laughs> he's enjoying his moment he was he was a very very nice gentleman and mm. it was very nice to meet him but it was cold yesterday i slept in my long johns last night my pyjamas are all dirty, the cat weed on them. Oh. <laughs> the boys had locked her in. The boys had locked the cat flap, so she um, uh, urinated. And I found it two days later on my pyjamas. So I was wearing my long johns. Wow. Oh, it's, it was cold. Why would a man wear pyjamas, though? Sorry? Why would a man wear pyjamas? What, what, what do you mean? It's not very... How can I put this? Um, it's not very sexy, is it? Depends how you wear oh, them, mate. No, no, it's not. Come on. Kath is a woman? I don't mind. Depends what's in a minute. <laughs> Me? <laughs> well. Oh. <laughs> Only pyjama bottoms. I don't wear pyjama tops. Oh, that's all right then, yeah. But I wear a T-shirt or something. <clears throat> what do you wear in bed? Nothing. Oh, oh no, Justin. I can't do that. What is a fire? For <laughs> 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 a burglar. a fire, my flatmates, they're going to be lucky. Wow. Oh, dear. Uh, I tell you what, well, do you know what? Can you go out on the street and do that a bit later on? Yeah, of Pajamas. course. We'll do that. We've got something a little bit more serious for you, but 08459 yeah. oh, five, 555. Five, five, five. Uh, I, I, I stay in a hotel on a Friday night because I work, I work away. Mm. Uh, and I've just, in the last two or three weeks, started taking my pyjamas with me to the hotel because normally I'd wear my pants. Oh, this is so sad. And I just started wearing the pyjamas in the hotel and it's wonderful. It's, no, oh, I feel so no. grown up. There'll be men listening to this right now just shaking their heads in absolute disgust. Pajamas are the best. I'm no. not trying to impress men, mate. I'm trying. I know that, but it's, it's not a manly thing to do. Uh, you know? Being a guy, you've got to be sexy, okay? <laughs> we're, we're, <laughs> on we're, your own. Yeah, no. Wearing pajamas, wearing slippers, this sort of thing. I love it slippers. Does nothing. It does nothing for men. I'm, out there. I'm tempted, and I've thought about this to uh, have a pair of work slippers that I leave <laughs> in the studio because I take my shoes off when I do the show. I do the show just in my stocking feet, yeah. and I'm tempted to have a pair of work slippers. Do it. Yeah. I'm okay. No. no I don't. will. Come on. Come on. How old are you? I'm 41. 41. Exactly, I'm the right age. No, no, you, you are way, way too young to be wearing slippers at home, you let them work. You can't, and also, this sleeping naked, I can't because I like everything to be um, uh, contained. I don't. Oh, wait, four five nine four double five five double five. Whose side are you on, ladies and gents, mine or Justin's? Now, we have got. We, we can go out and do that. We've also got something else a little bit more serious. Yeah, this is in a number of the papers this morning. Smokers and the obese have been pl- banned from having routine operations unless they lose weight or stop lighting up. Regional health chiefs have brought in the temporary measure as the government tries to save £20 billion in, in health care costs. So it's not everywhere, is it? But they're, they're, No, and they've been threatening to do this for a while, yeah. haven't they? Different, different organisations. Under the rules, patients with a body mass index of more than 30 so that's in brackets morbidly obese although there'll be people out there who can test this whole body mass index thing would be asked to lose 5% of their weight before planned surgery smokers will have to prove they've kicked the habit for at least 8 weeks before they can go under the knife only 8 weeks? yeah well, no, to be honest, it, it takes about three months before you start noticing any difference mm. from giving up yeah. smoking. I think th- th- there's, there's two sides to this. Obviously, the smokers, as a smoker myself, I would argue, hang on a second, I'm putting 
thousands of pounds into the system every single year by smoking. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But when it comes to so that's fine. But the no, fat no, people. No, no. no, but I'm. I'm. If I'm going to have an op- operation, I'm technically paying for it by the money that I'm putting yeah, but, into the system. But the counter argument to that is that you are decreasing your chance of a recovery by being unhealthy to start with. Yep, I get that. I okay, do. So they might be well. throwing good money after bad. Yeah, quite possibly. Okay, so that's so that's the, why you think that smokers, you should be, mm-hmm. shouldn't have to do this. But fat people, uh, I suspect there's a well, beef coming here. Um, a slight beef, yeah. I, I mean, I, I would argue that if you're going to sit at home all day long stuffing your face, oh, and wow. you, no, hang on, and, and you're obese, um, well, do you really deserve an operation? Do you? Well, they're they're paying they're paying taxes nowhere, as well. Nowhere near. Well, if they're compared sp- to smokers, if they're if they're buying more food, then they're they're paying the tax on the food. Yeah, but you you compare the, the tax transportation on food. used to, to, to transport that food. Mm. I just think that there are two there, two completely different issues when it comes to obese people. And yes, I, I fully understand. We have done this before on the streets a long time ago, where, where some people say, "Well, it's a medical con- condition." Well, yeah, okay, that's fine, but. Some some people, um, they're obese because they want to be obese. But it's also there's a there's a class thing that no one talks about as well, isn't there? A class you know, the people, yeah, people who are less well off will say it's more difficult to eat good food, and so they will go for the junk food, and it's difficult to keep the weight off when you're eating that. Yeah, I mean, there's that in there as well. Some, isn't that, there? A significant number of people addicted to food, Justin. Addicted. Uh, I wouldn't. Well, you can't compare addiction of food compared to addiction of, of smoking, can really? you? Really? Or can you? Yeah. I don't think so. This is this is great because this conversation already. I, I love having these chats with you, Just because it, it, we, we generally come from different points of view, and, and I think we both uh, learn a lot from it. This conversation has come on in the last four minutes. From is this right? To I think is is there a difference between fat people and smokers? Should they be treated? Is there a difference in the addiction? Do you believe in food addiction? Well, I think if you went to a doctor, no doctor would say to you you're addicted to food, but a doctor would say to you addicted. All right, not addicted to food, addicted to eating. Okay. But it's the slight, I've, subtle I've never difference. ever heard a doctor ever say that anywhere that this person. Well, hang on, you're they're, not they're, you're not a big lad that goes to doctors because hmm. you you're overweight. But from conversations, and we speak to a lot of people day yeah. in day out, I've never ever heard that term. But if you're addicted oh. to nicotine, well, you hear that all the time. You know, well, maybe it's it's the last great taboo. You know that there's um, a AA for Alcoholics yep. Anonymous, and there's NA for Narcotics Anonymous. Did you know there's an OA Overeaters Anonymous? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, there's the twelve step help groups for people who are unable to stop eating food. It's a shame thing, isn't it? They do it because they, they uh, don't like themselves and they, they're shameful, so they stuff mm. their faces and then they hate themselves even more, so it's cyclical. Well, w- when I'm feeling slightly down, what, what I would do, uh, I will go and eat a massive, great big tub of ice cream. That's, that's what I do if I'm feeling down. Yeah. I've so always, you understand I, then? I, I've always done that, but the next day, do I do it again? No, I don't. No, because you have the ability to stop. Mm. It's not an addiction. Smoking What's is an addiction. Eating food what, is not an addiction. That's like people who say, if I'm feeling down, I'll have a glass of wine. That doesn't make me an alcoholic. No, it doesn't, because you have the stop mechanism. I, I like this I like the, this, this uh, larger people thing, fat people yeah. thing. Should we focus on this? Can, Let's do it. can overeating be an addiction? Let's take it to the Just streets. Just you take it to the streets? I certainly will. Thank you for that. That Cheers. was like a production meeting on air. He's gone. <laughs> He's gone. <laughs> See you later. Bye. Ta-ta. 08459 four double five five double five. Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. On the M1 southbound, there's been an accident just after Junction 10 for the Luton Airport Spur Road, so three lanes are closed at the moment, and that's causing queues from Junction 11 for Dunstable Road. Having a look at the A5 on the speed sensors, and it's looking very busy now, all the way from Halton Regis to the M1 Junction 9 at Redbourne. Having a look in the speed sensors in Aylesbury, it's looking very slow on the A41 and on Douglas Road as well. And on the trains, Abellio Greater Anglia services have delays between Hartford East and Broxbourne. That's because of a points failure at Ware. Samantha Braff, BBC Three County. Radio. Thank you, Samantha. So, OK, we seem to have evolved a topic out of uh, one story into another. Can being large, can being fat, can eating food be addictive? 08459 four double five five double five. Local and vocal across beds, hearts and bucks. This is BBC Three Counties Radio.
It's seven o'clock, I'm Simon Oxley. The headlines, mental health nurses to work alongside Bedfordshire police officers. Criticism of A&E at Milton Keynes Hospital and Hitchin Singer wins a Brit Award. BBC Three Counties Radio. Nurses trained in mental health issues are being deployed alongside Bedfordshire police officers. It's to make sure the police correctly deal with people who are in a crisis because of their mental health. Police and Crime Commissioner Ollie Martins says it's one of many new measures they're introducing across the county. Sometimes you have people People who are having a mental health crisis but they may be a victim or perpetrator of domestic abuse, they might have substance abuse problems and by bringing the specialists closer to the police and working closely together uh, we can ensure that we handle these situations appropriately. Accident and emergency at Milton Keynes Hospital has received one of the worst ratings in the country by the health watchdog. The Care Quality Commission said the Trust had to review its performance as a matter of urgency to ensure good quality service. More from Tony Fisher. In its annual A&E patient survey, the CQC listed Milton Keynes in the top 10 for emergency provision that was worse than expected. Only last month, health regulator Monitor said the hospital had failed to fully address concerns about both its finances and A&E. The hospital says they've been doing a lot of work to improve patient experience in accident and emergency. Police searching for a missing mother and her newborn baby have found a woman's body. Charlotte Bevan walked out of a hospital in Bristol on Tuesday evening. Officers discovered the body in the Avon Gorge close to the Clifton Suspension Bridge. Her daughter is still missing. Seven people, including three children, were injured in a road crash in Milton Keynes last night. The emergency services were called to Watling Street in Bletchley near the junction with Wadden Way after a two-car collision at around 9.45. Firefighters had to release an injured man. Three women, two boys and a girl were also hurt. Reforms have come into effect for stamp duty announced by the Chancellor George Osborne in yesterday's autumn statement. Estate agents have praised the move, saying it will stimulate the housing market, but Labour say the Conservatives have no credibility after failing to meet their targets to cut the deficit. Hertfordshire singer-songwriter James Bay has landed the Critics' Choice Award at next year's Brit Awards, following the likes of Adele, Ellie Goulding and last year's winner Sam Smith. The 24-year-old from Hitchin will perform at the Brit's nomination party next month and was also part of the Rolling Stones' London concerts last year, as he told BBC Introducing on Three Counties Radio. It was it was Hyde Park, It was a, I guess it's kind of a festival atmosphere and it all feels like, you know, really cool like it would. And then you kind of realise that you've got, you know, the Stones are on the same bill. When I played, like, Everybody kind of, it was at the beginning of the day and everybody just crowded, crowded up to the stage and I got an amazing response. It was really cool. In sport, leaders Chelsea have extended their unbeaten start in the Premier League to 14 matches with a 3-0 win over Tottenham at Stamford Bridge. Second place, Manchester City won 4-1 at Sunderland. The weather, cloudy without breaks of rain or drizzle and feeling cold. A maximum temperature, 6 degrees Celsius. And you can get the latest news and sport online at bbc.co.uk slash three counties. Opening the doors on the biggest advent calendar in beds, hearts and bucks. Let's see who's behind door number four. Bernie Keith. Best toy I got as a child, Scalex Trick. I love Scalex Trick then, I love Scalex Trick now. When I look on the points on my licence, I can trace it all back to Scalex Trick as a kid. It's a wonderful thing. I wasn't a train set boy, but Scalex Trick I adored. I had about 20 cars. Building up to Christmas with BBC Three Counties Radio. Morning, this is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. It's a busy show this morning. No Kelly Betts, instead we've got Matt Lockwood. Yeah, you've got me. There we go, that was... that was. You didn't need to... He's still talking, I've turned his microphone off. We've also got Catherine Boyle. Yeah, hi. Hey, what's with the attitude, the sassy attitude? I'm always sassy. That's true. What's on the show this morning? We're talking about how police are getting to grips with mental health problems. Yep. We're also talking about how Milton Keynes A&E needs to get to grip with some problems there. Oh, yes, yes, And Justin Dealey's out on the street for us asking whether people have any sympathy for overeaters. Yes. He's not sure it's an addiction. He, uh, a lot of people aren't sure. For some, it's not an addiction, but for, but for some, it is. And uh, Justin doesn't seem to understand that. And it's, it all comes from this story, which uh, that certain health um, authorities. S- thank you very much indeed. Um, will not 
be... Operating on people who are over a certain weight until they lose 5% of their that, body weight. That was, that was it. That's how See, that's it. what I'm here for. Yeah, thank you very much. I finish my <laughs> sentences when I can't speak. Thank you very much indeed. 08459 four double five five double five. Across beds, hearts and bucks. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Now, a quarter of all incidents handled by Bedfordshire Police involve someone with a mental health problem, which is why they're trying out a new approach. As part of a host of new measures, they're going to take mental health nurses out on the beat. Well, joining me in in the studio now is Chief Inspector Jackie Whitred, who's leading uh, on the forces awareness and training around mental health, and Gail Deering is from SEPT, the NHS trust that delivers mental health services uh, in Bedfordshire. Thank you very much for coming in. Morning. Welcome. You're not happy, Gail, about this time of the morning. (laughs) First thing she said, what a ridiculous time in the morning to get me in. I'm all, right. I'm all right, I've got my coffee now, I'm but, all right. But you, you're both dosed up on coffee and you're sat here giggling like naughty school children, for goodness yes, sakes. Absolutely, you've got, to be, you've got to be jolly at this time in the morning. Gail, tell us, what, what, what kind of stories have you heard where in the past, um, not saying the police have necessarily got it wrong, but, 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 but situations have occurred? Yeah, I mean, I think I don't think it's about it's about getting things no. wrong. I think what happens is that when someone's in mental health crisis, um, a number of professionals will often get involved to make sure that person stays safe. And one of those people might be the police officer. Because quite yeah. often, with, with uh, the people the people with mental health issues become a, a, a aware noticed by the police because they've ended up the situation has gone on for so long that they've ended up in a, possibly breaking a law or something. Yeah, no, not necessarily. I mean, I think a lot of the time the police get involved. It's just because someone is having a mental health crisis, and that could be very sudden. Somebody could get up. Up one morning and actually feel quite suicidal and that right. may make them at risk. There may be someone who's who's got a long-term mental health condition who suddenly starts relapsing. It may be there's somebody on the street who's actually behaving in a bizarre way which causes attention to themselves and actually the police have to get involved to make sure that person's safe and if there's a mental health issue. So it's very complex. What kind of mental health issues are we talking about? We're talking about wide range. We're talking about anything. Anything that makes somebody go into crisis because either they're feeling low or they've got some sort of other mental health condition. It's very, very wide. Jackie, uh, what training are officers given around mental health? Well, our police officers are given um, some very good training, very good awareness, but I really should point out what that's about is it's to enable officers to understand, to recognise when somebody may be presenting Mm. a mental health issue. So we go out and we deal with a whole variety of scenarios. We don't know what we're going to be turning up to. We need to give our officers some of those tools just to start Mm. to raise that issue. This could be as a result of mental health. It might not be as straightforward as as it seems. But there's a really important point I want to make here. No matter how much awareness and training we give our officers, they are not mental health professionals Mm. and it would be very dangerous if we started to think of them in that way Um, and there's also you know there can also be a stigma attached with um, you know being taken away by the police Mm. we um, you heard earlier from uh, Dr uh, Baxter and the mm. event yesterday. What was really powerful about that was we had uh, a young man speaking uh, about his experiences uh, with mental health crisis and he described mm, that situation right. where police officers, he said they were very, very sensitive, mm. but I was sitting there in A&E with two police officers either side of me and I was asking myself, what have I done wrong? Mm. And this is somebody at the point of crisis, at the lowest point. I think that may be Ben Sammons, who mm. yeah, I yeah, think yeah, we're yeah, speaking to yeah. him a little bit oh, later on, so yes. we'll, we'll, we'll get his story. And I I suppose if you are suffering from a mental health crisis, yeah, suddenly a load of coppers turning up, yeah, that, could, yeah. that could really scare you, couldn't it? Yeah. And, and make it into, into a bigger situation than it that's needs right, to be. That's right, and that's the point of, and your, your story on the news around the fact that we're trying to pursue having mental health workers out with the police. We're not there yet, can I point that out, right. because we haven't got the funding yet. Yeah. However, it's a national project, and we're hoping that Bedfordshire and Luton will benefit soon from a pilot. You talk the, about the funding, yep. because the funding in mental health, we, we hear about cuts in the NHS, yep. although new money's coming in, but mental health <clears throat> has done particularly badly mm. uh, in, in terms in terms of cuts, where we we heard the story last week, which is unfortunately quite a common story, of, of the young lady who was in a police cell for two nights because there was nowhere for her That's to right. go. This That's happens right. quite a lot. That's right. So if these cuts are being made, how is this going to be funded? How are you going to be able to... How are you hoping to get nurses out Well, there? we're hoping. I mean, I suppose it's not for me to go into the politics no. of it. However, we are hoping there's monies through NHS England, for example, and perhaps possibly through the police commissioners, but it's difficult for me to say yeah, exactly how that's going to come about. But it is a national government priority, we're told. Yeah, and I think 
think, um, and I think that's why, I mean, Gail and I have been working hard on this subject for, for some time now, but yesterday was such a big day and getting mm. those key people together that yeah. own the resources, that have the influence to put the resources in the right place around mental health service is such a big deal. Yeah. And yeah. what was really significant for me is that um, uh, the clinical commissioning groups for Bedfordshire and Luton have really taken a positive lead in this. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's all well and good, the likes of myself and Gail representing our organisations, wanting more resources, knowing the barriers that we face. But until we put some more money, some more resources into the right places, yeah. we will continue to experience the same. We can carry on training people, we can carry on doing things with the you know, with the best intentions, yeah. but we do need some more resources. And with the clinical commissioning groups leading on the Concordat, the the detail that can then go into the action planning, that's where we're really hopeful that we can start to leave us some money into doing this. Do the, do the, the police, uh, uh, Jackie, do they, they want to have this training? Is there a kind of a common consensus that they want this to, to, to happen? Absolutely. Mm. Um, when I go around and talk to police officers, and Gail often mm. accompanies uh, me, you know, raising awareness, this is one of those areas where they are incredibly excited. They really recognise the significant difference that this could make to their day-to-day -day work. Um, and, that you know, that typical sort of 3 a.m., test mm. that's mm. that's the issue you think you know when most of us are sleeping in our beds a police officer is called to an crisis, incident yeah. a mental health crisis which and i think there's uh, we've found out about about over 70 70 percent of our mental health crisis issues occur out of office hours right. mm. that 3 a.m test an officer turns up they are the emergency service that's on duty hopefully with uh, ambulance service personnel, mm. uh, maybe with some A&E staff, but that is the point where we yeah. need that support and we accept that we need some support in making the right decision. We've got Mental Health Act legislation, so we will often use our powers under Section 136. What does, what's that? What does that mean? Uh, that means if a police officer um, speaks to an individual in the public and they believe that that individual is in need of immediate care or control because they're presenting a risk, risk to themselves or others, a police officer has a power to detain that person and take them to a place of safety. OK. Um, uh, so that's where we... That's where we need that support. What a mental health professional might do is look at that situation differently. Yeah, yeah. They may, may maybe they don't need to go to a place of safety. It may be that we can do an intervention quite mm. quickly and actually get the right people involved and do something else that avoids them having to go in because that's what often happens yeah. is they're taken, they come in, one of my workers will then assess and say, well, actually, this person didn't really need to come in. Yeah. Actually, there's a, there's a plan we can put in place very quickly. And with, yeah, now, Why is there like still this do. kind of uh, the stigma around mental health? Is it because we're afraid? Is it because we can't see? Is it because it can be so random? What, what is it? I think it's all those things, but I think it's it's a lot about the fact that we still don't consider um, mental health alongside physical health needs as anywhere near. We, we tend to sort of talk about physical health quite easily, but we don't talk about mental health. And if we started that as early as we did talking to children in schools around looking after themselves, mm. I mean, you were talking about obesity and smoking earlier. If we talked about mental health like that from a very early age mm. and we got people, it dispels all the myths then. Because people, you're right, the word you use is people get frightened and, and don't want to acknowledge. And, and there's nothing scary about mental health. We've all got one. Well, exactly. <laughs> we will all, probably, it will brush our lives at yeah, some point and, always, and all yeah, of us could, yeah, could, yeah, are potentially yeah. open to a mental That's health right. crisis. Yeah, absolutely. And it's one in four people, remember, at any one time maybe having some sort of mental health issue. So that's massive. Mm. And it could be anything from, um, you know, low-level depression through to a psychosis. It could be mm. anything. And you're right, it's it's out there. Are there other things, Gail, that are being introduced to, to improve mental health services across Bedfordshire? Is, are there, there, there other schemes happening? I think there's always, there's always things that are going on. For example, recently I've opened a young homeless triage service locally which is looking at the needs of young people who are facing homelessness we've got some projects going on around loneliness and social isolation mm. around mental health there's always there's always room for improvement mm. yeah hey listen it's really nice to see you both mm. thank you are you are you back to bed now or are you I'm coming in again later oh. <laughs> <laughs> always on duty uh, <laughs> Chief Inspector Jackie Whitford thank you very much and uh, Gail Deering from SEP thank you very much for coming in nice Thanks. to meet you 08459 455 555 is the phone number you can also send us a text Text if you want, 81333, start your text 3CR. Uh, or if you're, you're up on the, the old computers and stuff, innit, you can send me an email, ian.lee at bbc.co.uk. Let's get the travel. Travel news for beds, hearts and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. 
on the M1 southbound. Three lanes are closed just after Junction 10 for the Luton Airport Spur Road because of an accident, and that's causing very long delays from Junction 12 for Flitwick at the moment. It's happening effect as well on the airport way that's queuing to join the southbound M1 from Vauxhall Way, and also the A5 southbound is very, very busy from between the A505 just north of Houghton Regis towards the M1 at Junction 9 for Redbourne. Having a look at the A1 southbound on the speed sensors, it's looking very slow from the St. Neux Junction around the Black Cat Roundabout through the roadworks that are going on there. And in Chestnut on the A10 southbound, it's very busy between the Great Cambridge Road and the M25 Junction 25 at Enfield. On the trains at Belio Greater Anglia have half an hour delays between Hartford East and Broxbourne. That's because of a points failure at Ware. Samantha Braff, BBC Three Counties Radio. I don't know where, Samantha. <laughs> That's your job to tell us. It's a place called Ware. Guys... 7.15, it's Thursday the 4th of December, I'm Ian Lee. These are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio. Nurses trained in mental health issues will hopefully be deployed alongside Bedfordshire police officers. Accident and emergency at Milton Keynes Hospital has received one of the worst ratings in the country by the health watchdog. And Hitchens singer-songwriter James Bay has landed the Critics' Choice Award at next year's Brit Awards, following the likes of Adele, Ellie Goulding and Sam Smith. BBC Three Counties Radio. We've got a huge weekend of live football coming up for you here on BBC Three Counties Radio. Watford fell asleep from the cross and Donaldson powered the header in. It all starts tomorrow night as we take a trip to West London. And it's Luke Chambers, I think, who's got the touch. Gomez got a hand on it. The Hornets are away at Fulham, hoping to end the run of four straight defeats. And Cardiff, against the run of play, take the lead. Then on Saturday, attention turns to the FA Cup second round. And that could kill the tie now, and it's scored by the substitute, Green. MK Dons versus Chesterfield, and Luton's trip to Bury. Luton into the second round of the FA Cup, had a score, Newport 2. Then we'll round off the weekend on Sunday, as Wickham host AFC Wimbledon, aiming for that magical third round tie. A huge weekend of football starts tomorrow night from 7 here on BBC Three Counties Radio. 08459 455 555. Interesting conversations. And the, what we were just talking about there with Gail and, and Jackie kind of could, potentially does, maybe, maybe not, tie in with what the, the little mission we sent Justin out. But there was a story that various uh, health uh, groups around the country may stop uh, smokers from having operations until they've stopped smoking for eight weeks. Uh, and they may stop uh, larger people, fat people, um, having operations until they lose some weight. And it kind of got uh, Catherine and, and I talking to Justin, and we were discussing whether uh, uh, overeating is potentially an addiction. And do well, you have sympathy for fat people? Well, Justin, as a smoker, sort of highlighted the fact that it's an addiction and yep. it's more difficult than perhaps stopping eating. And we wondered whether that was the case for everybody. I don't think what Justin said about people sitting at home and stuff in their faces all day is necessarily the real picture. <laughs> There'll be, there'll be a few. There'll be a few of them. There always are. But I, I, I do genuinely think that... Well, let's see what Ian thinks. Morning, Ian. Morning, Ian. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. What would you like to say, sir? Yeah, I, I agree with you completely, Ian. I think that, you know, sleeping in the nude is unhygienic. And I think it's best to wear pyjamas. I thought you'd come on to talk about fat people. I had, but uh, <laughs> I was just thinking about the pyjamas. Well, I'm glad you, you, you can't... Sleeping in the nude is just a perversion. I don't <laughs> want my bare body on those clean sheets. No, absolutely. And if you have to get up to tinkle in the night, yeah. if, you know, then it's just unhygienic. It's, it's, it's drip catchage. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, where does this stop? You know, if somebody likes a drink, do you not then treat them because they're perhaps addicted to alcohol? What if somebody's addicted to painkillers? What if somebody's addicted to this or some, if somebody's addicted to that? It's, it's just discrimination. And not Justin says, people, smokers pay through the nose and they're paying for that. But I, suppo- I suppose, is it... Um... Is it, or if you're an alcoholic, okay, and you, you have done damage, let's say, to your liver through your drinking, mm. would the, the health groups be right in saying, well, we're not going to operate on your liver, we're not going to give you a new liver until you stop drinking? Is that, is that discrimination? Yes, I think it is, because it's an addiction. It's an addiction, and, and, and this goes back to food. I, I, people say, oh, I'm big boned, or I've got thyroid problems, etc., etc. I, I think it's an addiction. And people are, oh, don't accept that it's an addiction. I know somebody. You'll speak to them, and whenever you speak to them, they'll say, what, what are you eating? What are you eating? Oh, I'm eating some salad. 
oh, I'm eating a piece of fruit. Well, you don't get to 30 stone eating fruit and salad. Yeah, you, you often see those programmes where it's, well, yeah, I've just eaten it. Yeah, but how much salad are you eating? Cathy, you want to say something? Yeah, I was just... Uh, look, I've got a lot of sympathy for people who are battling um, compulsive behaviour. But at the same time, from a practical point of view, the NHS has got to save money. So how can you justify giving a new liver to someone who is not taking steps to control their addiction? And the only way you can get them to at least show that they're trying to do that is by saying, right, you've got to stop drinking, you've got to stop smoking, you've got to stop eating. Do you know what I mean? It's, it, it's a difficult one when you've got other people who are in that situation not because of something they've done to themselves. The, the other thing you've got, though, Kath, is what about people who do have diseases, which means that they're not going to live as long? So you Ooh. say, oh, well, you've got diabetes, so we're not going to treat you because it might not be worth the money in the long run. Ooh. Don't you think they make those decisions? I think they already make those decisions. Mm. You know, you're getting into really dodgy territory, aren't you? Yeah, because um, money's coming to it. Exactly. It's, it's my, Ian, and listen. now the trust themselves are having to look at the purse strings. Ian, thank you for that. Because that's the thing, isn't it? Now the doctors aren't just there to treat, they're also there to balance the books. We know uh, that what Ian was suggesting there is is done on an age basis. That a, a 75-year-old woman um, who's, who's only got a few years to live would probably not get the same treatment for the same condition as a 35-year-old man who is expected to have a significant, uh, significantly longer lifespan in front of them. So they may not get certain treatments because of money. And I also think that the quality or the the impact of the drugs is something they take into consideration. Yeah. I know a woman who was must have been in her early 60s and she was put on this course of statins oh, yeah. and it made her really ill, oh. really ill. Terrible headaches, she felt sick all the time, she felt dreadful. She thought, I must have something terribly wrong with me. She went to the doctor and the doctor looked at the medication she was on and said, oh no, we normally give this to OAPs. Oh, blimey, she was on the cheap stuff. Well, that's the suggestion, isn't, isn't that, it? Isn't that interesting? So that doesn't matter. Well, OK, this is really... This is great. This is expanding into so many different things. Uh, should um, uh, medical treatment be d- d- decided upon... Should finances come into it when it's medical treatment? And therefore, if you're older, you're going to get the cheap stuff as opposed to someone who's younger who'll get the good stuff and probably more stuff. And do you have any sympathy for fat people? Do you think that overeating is uh, a, 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 an addiction? And can't just be stopped. There are some of us who can go in it. You can have buy ten packets of biscuits, and we might eat a packet of biscuits in front of the telly, but we'll leave the other nine in the cupboard. That I suggest that there are some people who could not leave those other nine biscuits in the cupboard. They might try to, but they will go and eat them all. And before you think, oh, he's not talking about me, Justin Dealey let slip something about himself, didn't he? When he feels yeah. bad, he eats a whole tub of ice cream to himself. Yeah. We all have those moments, but it's about whether you can stop or not. 08459 four double five five double five. Across beds, hearts and bucks. This is Ian Lee. BBC Three Counties Radio. It's, uh... It's kind of a medical special this morning. A&E at Milton Keynes Hospital has received one of the worst ratings in the country by the health watchdog. The Care Quality Commission said the Trust had to review its performance of the department to ensure good quality service. Its annual A&E patient survey listed Milton Keynes in the top ten for emergency provision that was worse than expected. Ouch. Andrew Pakes is the Labour prospective parliamentary candidate for Milton Keynes South and joins me now. Morning, Andrew. What do you make of this report? Good morning. Uh, I think it's uh, another warning sign of the the huge pressures facing hospital as it tries to manage, you know, budget constraints but also growing demand. The real issue in Milton Keynes is we're growing so fast as a new town that the size of the A and E, the capacity we've got in the in the town, does not keep up with the the demand that's going through the door. Uh, well, well, do you think that the hospital is doing the best job that it can under the uh, the circumstances? I think we've got some amazing doctors and nurses in A&E and the the whole hospital team is doing the best it can. Uh, But we know that in July in the summer, uh, you know, when the weather was good, uh, the hospital had its busiest ever day uh, since A&E's opened uh, with too many people coming through to be seen. Uh, And the surveys I've done speaking to people about their experience at the hospital, uh, the vast majority say that the care they receive from nursing staff and doctors is brilliant, just that the building facilities are not big enough for what we need. Oh. Well, the survey focused on the key aspects of patients' experience, particularly on how caring it is. 
Absolutely, and if, and if what we've got in Milton Keynes is a, an A and E, it was not built for the number of people coming through the door. We're seeing it become full up as more and more people turn up. Some of them can't get doctor's appointment. Some of them have problems elsewhere in the health system and turn up to A and E because they need something done. I mean, what this report says uh, and backs is that the local campaign that's going on to support the hospital. It, bid to get a brand new, a larger A&E built so that we can actually deal with a rising population. Uh, and there's no decision yet about expanding the A&E department, not, not until after the next election. If Labour get in, is, are you making a promise that the, the uh, £21 million expansion of the A&E will happen? Uh, my promise is that we will fight and get the A&E in Milton Keynes. We will stop the health review that's going on, and I've been on Speak to You and, and listeners have heard us debate that as well. The cost of a new A&E is £21 million. Um, this week, the Chancellor said he was looking at putting another £2 billion into the NHS. If the Chancellor himself says the money's there, I think a small slice of that cake should come to us to get that A&E built so that we're fit for purpose. Andrew, good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Andrew Pakes, Labour prospective parliamentary candidate for Milton Keynes South. Peter's in Warmer Green. Morning, Peter. What do you have a whinge about today? The same thing as you've just been talking about, Go actually. on then, fella. Because the Care Quality Commission has stated that, they are also responsible for the problems of the A&Es because... What, the, the CQC are? Well, of course they are, because they haven't complained when A&Es have been shut, 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 and they've put all the other A&Es under a great deal of pressure. Hang on a minute. All the Care Quality Commission does, Peter, is go round and uh, yeah. points out where hospitals are doing badly and where hospitals are doing well. They, they, Quite. They, Quite, but it's but the Care Quality Commission. What? If you're if you're affecting the care and quality of patients' safety by shutting A and E's, because the Care Quality Commission don't do that. No, but they should be complaining about it happening where the shut where where A and E's are being shut. No, 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 that's not their job because if if I do not, it. Well, no, it's not their job. It's their not job. my job. It's not your job. But we want all but, our relatives <laughs> saved. But why? I, well, yeah, I know, but it, it doesn't work like that. That's not the Care Quality Commission's. Fault. Well, I, what, I'm, afraid, it, for, I'm afraid for me. If you're your I'm afraid for you. care worker, or any sort of care worker, yeah. and you see A and E's being shut right across the country, they're not care workers. They're a monitoring service. Yes, but they recommend but, improvements and they praise people when they're doing well. But they're supposed to be a caring organisation. Well, they know for no, fact. No, they're not. The ty- no, Peter. Peter, you're getting. Listen, normally you. You're, you're, I know. I no. know what you're saying. Listen, because you're. I don't want you to go on um, any answers or any questions on Radio Four this weekend, making this same point and looking like an idiot on Radio Four. So let's consider this. And I've heard Peter on so many other radio stations. Let's, you little tart. Let's <laughs> consider this a rehearsal, okay? For when you do a proper radio phone in, right? All right. Let me just make my point. No, let me stop you. Yes, I know what you're saying. I know exactly what you're saying. The Care Quality Commission are not a caring organisation. They are simply monitors that go out there and monitor that hospital's doing well, this hospital's doing okay, this hospital's doing badly, in this, this and this. That's all they do. I know, but they can make a statement of the reasons why. They do. Well, they don't really. They do. Have you ever read a CQC report? I've never read one you in should do. I've seen it in newspapers. Thank you very much indeed. I have. I, I've, I've read some of a CQC. I've read some of two CQC reports about High Wycombe Hospital and Wexham Park Hospital. I didn't read all of it because I think they're about 110 pages they long. They are long and detailed documents. Boy, oh boy, they very kindly do a traffic light system at the start to give you the kind of key points and then you can go to the little chapters that you want. And I, and I went to the little chapters that I wanted uh, and they were very <laughs> thorough reports. But it's not up to them to stop A&E departments closing or to, to campaign. They're, they're not the, the Caring and Quality Commission. They're the Care and Quality Commission. They're like an exam board for hospitals. It's still bad of them, though, isn't it, to um, raise their points and then not go in and solve them? It's as if they're just watchdogs. What's, I heard Peter on... Uh, maybe I heard Peter on Five Live or LBC the other day. He's such a little minx. He really... He kind of gives us the sexy wink and then he'll be off talking to someone else. I couldn't believe it. Uh, well, it's probably about six months ago when I heard him on Radio 4. I feel so used. Isn't it awful? You're right, Matt. He's got such a good voice. I could listen to his voice all day. Well, you could. I could listen to Peter's <laughs> yeah. voice all day. Luckily, I've got a fader and I can cut him off. Travel news for beds, cards, and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. 
There are some serious problems on the M1 southbound. Three lanes are closed just after Junction 10 for the Luton Airport Spur Road and it's causing queues now from Junction 12 for Flitwick, also making it very slow on Airport Way joining the M1 southbound and the A5 southbound from uh, just north of Houghton Regis towards the M1 at Junction 9 at Redbourne. It's very busy too. But further back on the M1 at the back of the queue, two lanes are closed between Junction 14 for Milton Keynes and 13 for Bedford as well because of another accident. And if you're planning to use the M11 instead to avoid these accidents on the M1, it's south Bound, it's blocked between Junction 6 for the M25 and 5 for Loughton. In Beaconsfield, Amersham Road is getting very busy between Longbottom Lane and the A40 London Road. And in Hemel Hempstead, the A41 southbound is looking very busy between the Hemel Hempstead turnoff and the M25 Junction 20 at Kings Langley. On the trains of Belia Greater Anglia have half hour delays between Hartford East and Broxbourne. And that's because of a points failure. Samantha the breath, BBC Three Counties Radio. Wow, the comments. Thank you, Samantha. Facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. We're asking, do you have any sympathy for overeaters? Ian says, no, they eat because they want to eat. We all have willpower and self-respect, or unless they haven't got any mirrors. 08459 four double five five double five. Across beds, hearts and bugs. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. It's 7.30, I'm Simon Oxley. Mental health nurses are set to join Bedfordshire police officers on the beat. A quarter of all incidents handled by Beds Police involve someone with a mental health problem. Accident and emergency at Milton Keynes Hospital has received one of the worst ratings in the country by the health watchdog. The Care Quality Commission said the Trust had to review its performance as a matter of urgency. Police in Bristol searching for a missing mother and her newborn baby have found a woman's body. And Hitchin singer-songwriter James Bay has landed the the Critics' Choice Award at next year's Brit Awards, following the likes of Adele, Ellie Goulding and last year's winner, Sam Smith. Three Counties Sports. BBC Three Counties Radio. Chelsea remains six points clear at the top of the Premier League after a 3-0 win at home to Tottenham, but Jose Mourinho says Spurs deserve better. I have to be fair, I think uh, it would be normal as a consequence of the way Tottenham started that Tottenham score before us and we have to chase the, the game. I'm really happy with the points and uh, with the performance and with the spirit but I think Tottenham for them is, uh, is too heavy, 3-0, because they didn't play for that result. Second place Manchester City won 4-1 at Sunderland with Sergio Aguero scoring twice. Arsenal beat Southampton 1-0 with a last-minute goal from Alexis Sanchez and Everton and Hull drew one all. Luton have sold their extra allocation for the Boxing Day trip to Wickham, meaning over 2,600 Hatters fans will be at Adams Park and Luton's home game with Portsmouth two days later is also now a sellout. England's cricketers won the rain-affected third one-day international in Sri Lanka by five wickets under the Duckworth Lewis method. They now trail 2 1 in the seven match series. But Captain Alistair Cook is facing a suspension if England are found guilty of a slow overrate. It's incredibly hard when you only play one spinner. And also, you can see how big the ground is. The batters take quite a long time to come out. But we knew that coming in. We, we try to be as quick as you can, but. We probably were a little bit slow today. Um, I don't know what the punishment will be, or if there is any. There will be a record 21 Formula One races next year, compared to 19 this year. The Korean Grand Prix returns with a new race in Mexico. The British Grand Prix at Silverstone is on July the 5th. And a report out this morning says the Tour de France's visit to the UK this summer was watched by 4.8 million people and generated around £128 million. BBC Three Counties News and Sports. The next full bulletin is at 8. Across beds, hearts and bucks. This is Ian Lee. BBC Three Counties Radio. The geek in me is coming alive. I'm so excited about a guest we've got in just under an hour's time. I'm getting a little bit excited. A little bit of wee's coming All out. All right, yeah, OK. Yeah. A little bit of wee wee's coming no. out. No, mm. no, that's not the chorus. Mm. Mm. Wee's coming no. out. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. A little the boys bit of are wee's coming town. out. Listen to what you're singing. A little bit of wee's coming out. Don't join yeah, in. Yeah, a little bit of oh, wee's coming out. I'm so excited. Yes. A little bit of... No. OK. A little bit no. of Monica for my soul. A little bit of Jessica for my soul. A little bit of Annika for my soul. A little bit of Monica for my soul. Memo number five. Good morning, BBC Three Counties Radio. 
Hello, Mark. Can you tell them to stop singing that song about we coming out? Anyway, I'm excited, Matt. Do you know why I'm excited? Uh, why? Playing about. <laughs> what? Oh, no. <laughs> what can I do for you? Uh, because well, they, do, you're, you, don't, you don't remember the ZX Spectrum, do you? I remember the Commodore C64. What a great machine that was. Well, that was great. But mm. the, the ZX Spectrum is being remade, or a, an updated version of it, here in, in Luton. <laughs> in Luton. So much stuff happens in Luton. It is a hotbed of news. So they're coming on to talk about that in about an hour. Great. And I was, it's, a, it's a Kickstarter project where you, yeah. you give them a few quid and they yeah, make yeah, you one. Yeah. And I've just gone on to give them a few quid and make them one. Uh, they've sold out. Oh, no. Oh, oh, guys. Yeah. But if it's you, they might make one especially for you. Yeah, OK. What's that noise? Is someone brewing up in there? Is that Jetpack? Okay. Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. Very, very excited to do that. Jamie's in Dunstable. Good morning, Jamie. Morning. What have you got for us, sir? You want to talk about the A and E? Yeah, I just wanted to defend the hospitals a bit. Oh. I was in I was in one recently and they're so overworked. It's unbelievable. Um they work so so hard and they just haven't got the resources. Um when I was at school, which is about twenty years ago, we were told the population was about fifty five million. Population is now about 70 million, and they haven't built any more hospitals or A&E. They're closing them. So, of course, they're going to struggle. So what do we do to fix that, then? It just, it, it just needs more resources. It's as straightforward as that. You increase the population by that percentage. You need to increase the hospitals by that percentage. But it's, it's, not, not, it's not just uh, the number of people, is it? Well, no. I mean, there is a management issue as well. But, I mean, it's just volume. It's just volume of well, people. It's, it, well, yeah, but it's because we're, we're all living longer and there are more diseases and there are more treatments for more diseases. It's not just that, though. But, I mean, the general A&E is, isn't diseases and things like that. That's just I've fallen over and broken something. Well, it's not and quite. It's, it's not just that. A lot of it is. I mean, I've sat in A&E and you've got somebody there who's got a splinter or... Or broken a thumb, or I mean, there's a reason because they've if got, you've, got if, you've bro- if you've broken a thumb, Jamie, where would you go? I'd go A and E. There you go, you see. Yeah, yeah, but that's not a deadly disease. It's not more, but that's not because we're living longer. <laughs> but A and E departments aren't overworked because we're living longer. That's well, no, just... no, no. I'm talking about that, but you know, the whole NHS system is kind of interconnected. Yeah, so it that is. puts it's... the strains on the resources. It does, but I mean, I, I was sat in the ward. I wouldn't say there's. A... It, I wouldn't say old people are, 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 are any greater strain on it than they did. But, um, but, but, but Jamie, they are, of course older people are putting a strain on the NHS because they are living longer. But just the general volume of people. If you've got that percentage of much more people, you're going to get a strain anyway. Right, it but it doesn't, it doesn't excuse people getting a bad service or not being treated properly, does it? No, not at all. But that, I don't, it's, not the, it's not the staff's fault, is what I'm saying. Is I'm defending the, hospital, the people who work in the hospital because they work so hard. There just isn't enough of them. Uh, you know, I don't. I know, and I don't think we've been we've been saying it's the the, the fault no. of the staff. But thank no, you, no, for, no. thank you for highlighting that, Jamie. It's appreciated. Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of the conversation we were having about midwives yesterday, and yeah. we had the uh, message through from the mid- midwife who said it's all very well making these decisions on yeah. high, but actually they're the people who have to pick up pick up the slack, or actually, there, there is no slack at the moment. Yeah. So, no, I don't think we'd ever um, accuse the staff of being at fault for this. Now, what's this uh, we've been talking about? Um, why are we talking about large people? Just remind Some us. NHS trusts are talking about potentially refusing to operate on people who are um, a, uh, smokers yeah. or who are uh, morbidly obese unless they change their ways. I think if you are um, rated morbidly obese on the body mass index uh, scale, you will be told in some areas to lose 5% of your body weight before they'll operate on you. Well, you know figures and everything. Well, I remember. Hey. Um, and smokers will be told to give up for at least eight weeks before an operation will take place. Fair enough. Well, they've got to save money. Do you yeah. think it's a reasonable request to make? And we were talking about it earlier on with Justin and he sort of balked at the uh, smoking one because he said, no, that's an addiction. But he did think that maybe uh, eat, overeating was less of a compulsion. That, that's, that's about right, isn't it, Just That's, that's where right. we, yeah, we ended it. Very interesting conversation earlier on, because, you know, as a smoker, um, I, I do firmly believe that is a real addiction. It's a, it's a horrible addiction to kick, but when it comes to, to eating junk food, I eat it every now and again, but that, for me, is not an addiction, and I don't think you can compare the two, can you? 
Can you? I don't think you can. You've taken it to the... Uh, Matt muttering to himself there. You've taken <laughs> it to the streets, Justin. What, what have people said? Well, th- there's some really interesting stuff coming up here, actually. I had to tread uh, very carefully with this one. Uh, you, you approached fat people, didn't you? I, I, I approached some of these people and I approached... Some of these people? No, 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 obese no, some, people, some, some obese people oh, right, and some, some of these smokers people. as well to right. um, so get their views on this. Um, here's what people had to say. Lorraine, um, I'm going to tread very carefully with this because you said to me that that you are obese. I'm not going to make you laugh, don't worry. Um, But we're talking about smoking, uh, and my argument is that that smoking is very addictive. Eating fast food, eating foods that that are bad for you, do you think that's, that's also an addiction as far as you're concerned? No. No, it's not. I, I, I eat what I like. <laughs> so it's not addiction. Um, how can I put this? Is it, is it a choice? Is it laziness for, for you to choose the foods which are, which are worse for you? Because it is laziness, especially on a Friday night, love, yeah. I go in for no way. Get me takeaway out. So what do you eat on a Friday? Indian wine. Well, I drink wine. I love me wine. And you're happy being the size that you are? Yeah, apart from my stomach. <laughs> Um, if the NHS turned around and said to you, sorry, you can't have an operation because we're classing you as obese, yeah. how do you think that might make you feel? I think it's terrible. It's upsetting, isn't it? So if you need an operation, you need an operation, don't you? Simple as that. But if they said to you, for, for the next couple of months, you've got to lose weight, you've got to do something about it first, would you accept that or would you still be quite angry? I'd be angry, but if I needed an operation, I'd probably go for it, yeah. I'd probably do it. So you've been to the doctors and you've been classed as obese, correct? Yep. Yep, I am. We're talking this morning about smoking. Um, it's my view that, that smoking is an addiction. Would you go along with that? Smoking is an addiction, but I don't smoke. OK. Would you also class eating fast food, foods that are, are really bad for you, as an addiction as well? I'm not the addict, but still I'm obvious. <laughs> but there's a difference between the two then. So you're yeah. saying that the smokers are definitely addicted, whereas eating bad foods, that's a choice? Uh, yeah, that's it. Morning, sir. We're talking about addictions this morning. Do you class smoking as an addiction? Yes. Yeah, I do. Okay, do you also class eating unhealthy foods as an addiction? Is that the same thing? I don't believe it is, no. No, not at all. If the NHS said to you, and you're smoking your, your cigar this morning, actually, very yeah. posh, um, if the NHS said to you, you're not having an operation until you've quit for at least eight weeks before, how do you think you might react to that? If that's what they said, that's what they actually told me, then... Uh... Yeah, I'd quit for those eight weeks beforehand and have the operation then. So there'd be no complaints from you? No, not at all. Well, so most people there agreeing with you. Yeah. And what that says to me, Justin, is that we need to educate people more. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just because they... I hate to, to point this out, but just because yeah. some people in Luton said it on the street don't, <laughs> don't mean it's fact. No, it doesn't mean it's fact. But, you know, talking to people this morning that have been classed as obese, um, um, they clearly said to me, it's my choice. It's my choice to, to eat the foods that I want to eat, um, to, to drink what I want to drink, uh, and that's why I'm, I'm obese. They, they didn't class um, their weight and what they eat as an addiction, it was their choice. Their words, not mine. There are websites, foodaddiction.com, uh, and there are um, uh, 12-step programmes for, for uh, overeaters. Mm-hmm. And I think, and I'm just trying to make sure I've got this right, because I, 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 I think the World Health Organisation classifies food addiction as a real disease. <sighs> for, for me, I say, what, what, do, what do the World Health Organisation <laughs> know, for God's sake? It oh, those it, idiots, it, the it who? Listen, it doesn't mean I'm right, but I'm sure that, you know, even people this morning talking to me, it's just my view. I'm sure that most people will back me up on this one. Eating fast food, that is not an addiction. That is a choice. But it's not specifically the eating of fast food. It's the uh, inability to stop eating food. Mm-hmm. Whereas, uh, it, it's quantities, isn't it? We're not talking about you know going to a certain outlet. It's talking about quantities and knowing when to stop. Quantities, again, comes back to choice. I think if, if you go and speak to any doctor but, um, when it comes to nicotine, that is a serious drug. That is a serious why addiction. Is that, you why cannot is that, compare the two. Well, well, no, you, well, you can. Because well, you can't. The, well, you can because why, is, why can you not stop smoking? 
Uh, because it's nicotine. So how do people stop that, smoking? That's a drug. I don't see any foods classed as drugs. No, because what the foods do is they release uh, endorphins and dopamine in your brain. You are mm-hmm. drugging yourself. You are making yourself feel high yeah. through uh, continuing eating. You, that is, that is, that you, know, you know that you can be addicted to shopping, yeah? <sighs> not really. Come on. Not really. Wow. I love it. You may like shopping, but you yeah. can't be... You can't be addicted. Gamb- OK, you can, be, you can be addicted to gambling. Yeah? You know that. <sighs> Possibly. Again, I, okay. I, I well, where's the drug in gambling? <sighs> I don't know. I don't know. All, all I'm saying is, when it comes to food, for me personally, I love it. that is not an addiction. And I'm sure this morning that most people will agree with me. You eat fast foods. You eat the unhealthy foods. Yeah. That is a choice. It's not a drug. Justin, great Vox. What was the other thing we were going to we were going to send you out on? <laughs> Pajamas. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you got anything on that yet? Um, later, after eight. Speak to you after eight. Thank you very much indeed. Pajamas. Justin Dealey sleeps in the nude. That's one for the ladies, and indeed many of the gentlemen listening. We have a huge gay following on this show, which is yeah. wonderful. Um, uh, I prefer to sleep in the Jimmy Jams, although I had long johns on last night. The most f- unflattering of clothing available to anyone, I think. And if you're interested, I vary my attire. Sir. And you levels sleep, of. You sleep with a tyre? No. Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. On the M1 southbound, there's three lanes closed because of an accident just after Junction 10 for the Luton Airport Spur Road, and that's queuing now from Junction 12 for Flitwick. And it's also starting to look very slow on the M1 northbound past that stretch with people slowing down to look at the accident. It's causing long queues on the A5 southbound as well, from the A505 just north of Houghton Regis all the way down to the M1 at Junction 9 for Redbourne, with people trying to divert from those problems on the M1 around Junction 10. On the M1 southbound as well, at the back of the queue, two lanes are now closed between Junction 14 for Milton Keynes and 13 for Bedford because of another accident involving four vehicles there. On the A1 southbound, it's queuing between the St. Neots Junction and the Black Hat Roundabout through the roadworks there. And on the trains of Elia Greater Anglia have half an hour delays between Hartford East and Broxbourne, and that's because of a uh, points failure at Ware. Samantha Braff, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Samantha. It's 7.46. It is uh, Thursday, the 4th of December. I'm Ian Lee. These are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio. Nurses trained in mental health issues are being deployed alongside Bedfordshire police officers. Accident and emergency at Milton Keynes Hospital has received one of the worst ratings in the country by the health watchdog. And Hitchin singer-songwriter James Bay has landed the Critics' Choice Award at next year's Brit Awards. Let's get the weather. Here's Alina. It's Hearts and Bucks weather. BBC Three Counties Radio. Morning, Ian. Thank you. A cloudy, cold day ahead. The cloud thick enough at times to give some light rain or drizzle in a raw field of the day. A high of 5 Celsius, 41 degrees Fahrenheit. Mostly cloudy overnight, again some light rain or drizzle at times, but becoming drier from the west later in the night. Temperatures dropping down to around 1 or 2 Celsius. May see a little bit of brightness for a time first thing tomorrow, but generally still a lot of cloud and then some outbreaks of light rain mid to late morning. But as that clears away southeastwards, something brighter and clearer for the end of the day and a high of 6 Celsius, 43 Fahrenheit. Clear skies overnight will lead to a widespread frost on Saturday but by contrast, Saturday will be dry with plenty of sunshine. BBC Three Counties Radio, I'm Alina Jenkins. BBC Three Counties Radio's big tour of beds, hearts and bucks. Well, I think it's a place that has everything. I, I love it. I don't think I'll probably ever move away. Quite friendly. I mean, there's another reason why I probably settled down here, because I managed to make friends quite quickly. All this week, we're discovering Bedford. We love it. You know, the atmosphere and the people. Ah, oh, the river, the embankment, uh, the Swan Hotel. The, the town's a great town. The river, obviously the jewel and the crown running it through it. Telling everyone about where you live. It's somewhere where we've made lots of friends and we We've come to regard it very much as home. Well, the very best thing, obviously, is the river, because I think it's absolutely gorgeous. The big tour of beds, hearts and bucks from BBC Three Counties Radio. Mark's in Bedford. Good morning, Mark. Morning, Ian. How are you? I'm good, thank you, boss. What you got for us? Right, uh, basically, I think that they should uh, do like a... Basic, draw a line in the sand as it is. The NHS we're talking about here. Yep. Draw, draw a line in the sand and write and say, anybody that doesn't adhere to these rules moving forward will not get any treatment. Oh. Wait, so every year you go to your doctor, yeah. which I know is going to cost more in the long run. I know you're going to say that, but it's going to cost speculate to accumulate. Okay. So you, you go to an MOT and the doctor turns around 
around and says to you, gives you away, checks you've been smoking or drinking, ticks the boxes, and in effect, wh what the NHS is, is an insurance against your health, no matter how you look at it. So if anything happens to you, you will get treated. If you don't adhere to the rules, and in effect you've got points on yourself, mm. then you, it's down to yourself to go and get the American-style uh, insurance for your health. And depending on what sort of condition you're in, due to your own choices then depends on what your premium is. It's a bit fascist, isn't it, having to go to the doctors every year to tell them how much you've been drinking, how much you've been smoking and what you weigh so yeah, they can log it. But ultimately, that's the only way it works. The reason why the NHS is in trouble is because it's not financially viable. OK, it's what so I, I decide to opt out of the NHS by smoking. How do I get my money back? Good question. You're good, aren't you? Yeah, you see? How do I get my money back? Because if, I'm not, if I've been excluded from the system, then I want some of my money back, please. Yeah, but it, it's all about drawing a line in the sand. But it's, it, you can't... You've, there's always an argument for what's happened before and what's going to happen in the future, and that's the trouble. Nobody, look, nobody looks at the actual facts and says, right, this is how it's going to work and this is how it's got to work. Forget the past and move forward. You can't... You know, what you've just said there is giving my money back. I mean... You could argue that you've probably already spent your money. If you've been all right, all right. Uh, then how do I... OK, in that case, let me rephrase it. How do I stop contributing into the NHS, then? How do I stop paying? What, do, do you, I, I don't pay any national insurance. And yeah, I get don't tax, pay no NI. Yeah, you and stop I get paying a tax NI. rebate. Say that again? And I get a tax rebate at the end of every year. If you, if you, if you deserve it, yeah. Mark, can I ask you a question? And please... Uh, well, you may... I say please don't be offended. You might be offended. And I'm going to put my Go neck on. on the line here. You sound like a fat lad. I'm skinny as light. Are you really? Yeah. You've got a fat yeah. voice. That's because it's early in the morning. No, it's, um, what do you call it? I, I probably weigh about, what, 13 to 14 stone. Yeah. Yesterday, I ate a cream cake in the morning, a sausage roll, uh, a pasty. You're living the dream, uh, mate. Yeah, I am living the dream yesterday, trust me. But today, I'm going to go out, I'm going to work on site this morning, so I'm going to work it off. Yeah. But the long and the short of it is, if I don't do any work, I start getting fat. Yeah. But, the, but the point being is, they're, they're choices you make. I mean, if, if when I was at school, and, and now I left school, and they kind of said, if you smoke, you're not going to get treatment for cancer, trust me, 100% my head would have kicked in, and I would have gone, I'm never going to smoke. And if they turn around and said, if you ever do drugs, you're never going to get any mental health treatment, a lot of people wouldn't do it. Mark, final it, question, it, final question, because I've got to move on, because I've got a guest um, online, but uh, is, can overeating be an addiction? Yes, I, I think it is, yeah. Mark, thank you very much indeed. 08459 four double five 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 double five. I hesitated asking that question. And then you uh, plunge straight in. But Well, sometimes I think you've just got to ask, he did sound like he had a fat voice, do you know what I mean? He sounded like a big lad, yeah. Didn't he? Some people do. It's, um... What would a thin voice sound like? Me. I'm thin. Well. This is a thin voice. But yours sounds like a snotty voice. You always sound like you, you've got guitar or something. Yes, well, the, I do have a, let a Kath, medical condition. Let, let Kath speak. I told you about that radio boss who uh, called me in just to see what I looked like because he thought I'd oh. be a big blonde. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Apparently that's what I sound like. I've got a big voice. You, you, a big girl You don't voice. sound like a big girl. You don't think? No. Kelly sounds like a tiny girl. Yeah, which she is. Um... I mean, uh, Roberto's got a... He's got a, he's got a big, a voice. big voice. He's got a big voice. Jonathan Vern Smith. Massive. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, four, five, nine, four, double, five, five, double, five. If you want to phone up, and, and I'll, I'll try and guess your weight. Not weight, but whether you're big or slim. I've got no idea what my weight is. I haven't weighed myself for... Oh, well, I had a medical a few years ago, and I was waiting for that, but I didn't take notice of it. I judge myself on the tightness of my trousers. Yeah, so do I. I don't fit them anymore. I judge you on the tightness of your trousers. Oh. Hey... Oh wait, four five nine four double five five double five. Now here's something that uh, do you remember this was brought up in the meeting, right? About uh, male breast cancer, yes. right? And I thought, I thought, hey, hey guys, we all know that blokes can get breast cancer. Matt, you know that blokes can get breast cancer, don't no, you? No, I didn't know. You were one of the ones that didn't know. No, J uh, Tony, Tony Fisher, Fisher, his mind was blown. Didn't know. Justin Daly didn't know no. that men can get no. breast cancer. I Never. thought we knew this. A relative of mine's had treatment for it, so I knew. It's quite common. Breast cancer affects nearly 55,000 women annu annually in the year, but it's uh, an issue for around 350 men every year. The drummer from KISS had breast cancer. Uh, wake up, people. Mike uh, Hickling uh, from Aylesbury is on the line. Morning, Mike. Good morning to you, sir. You were diagnosed with breast cancer. Yes, I was. Did you know that blokes could get it? Yes. We were so surprised when this story popped up in the office the other day, and um, three of our colleagues went, what? 
bloke, the blokes can't get that. It's, it seems a lot... When you've mentioned it to friends and family and colleagues, have any of them been surprised? Um, no, because um, everybody in the world has bre- breasts. Yeah. But they're just not pronounced in men. Yeah. Well, so you still got underneath. You still got the same sort of physical makeup. So, Mike, tell us what happened. How did you? What made you think there was a problem? Right. Well, at the end of this year, at, um, the end of September, right, I was in the shower, just washing myself down. I thought, oh, there's a lump on my sort of just above my left nipple. So that was at the weekend. On the Monday, I rang my local uh, Bedgrove surgery, and because of what I said, I had an appointment the following day on the Tuesday at 10 o'clock. Saw the doctor. um, He felt it, and he said, I'm going to refer you to the breast unit clinic at High Wycombe. Um, If you don't hear from me within a fortnight, give me a ring back. Well, that was the Tuesday. The following morning at 9 o'clock on the Wednesday, the breast unit were on the on the phone. Wow. Would you like to come in on Friday? So they were taking it seriously. They were taking yeah. it very, very seriously. So I went in on the Friday morning just for a day appointment, and they um, did some tests and some scanning, and then they took a biopsy of the the lump right and they sent me back in to have another couple of tests and by the time that had finished i went to see the specialist the same day and he said yes it's breast cancer um we will operate in four weeks blimey um so i went home <laughs> then went to Mexico. <laughs> what? Yes. What were you doing in Mexico? Well, I thought I'd go on holiday if, yeah. if, if God was coming to get me. <laughs> really? Was that, did you go as a result of that? Yes. Oh, well done you, Mike. And the other thing that I did That's as well... That's brilliant. The other thing that I did as well, um, I um, didn't take my old age pension at age 65. Yeah. I just let it um, carry on. So immediately... <laughs> I've been dying now, and I thought, I'm drawing this now. Good lads, <laughs> cashing it in. Yeah, what did cash- you spend it on? I, I haven't yet. Beautiful. But, um, uh, I've got a lump sum of about 20 grand that I've saved up, so... Oh, well done, you. It, it, so uh, what but, did they do? So they operated? Yeah, they operated um, in uh, on the 29th of October. It was a day visit. Wow. Right? This is so incredible. you go in in the morning, they operate during the morning... And providing you've got somebody to stay with you for 24 hours, 48 hours after the operation, you can go home. Yeah. Right? So my daughter picked me up, Becky picked me up and took me home. Um, The following day, I was out shopping in Milton Keynes for six hours. Flipping heck. Played bridge in the evening. Well. And, you know, it's... (laughs) (laughs) I can't play golf at the moment, but I'm... Come January. Are you, are, you, are you still a bit tender? Um, ever so slightly. Yeah. Only yeah. slightly. There's a five-inch scar, and um, they've taken out um, uh, a nipple. Oh, blimey. So have you, got no, have you only got one nipple? Yeah. Could they not put a fake nipple on? Nah. Do they not do that? Nah. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to do that, because no. I think one of, the, one of the things about, and the main reason why yeah. um, I'm talking to you on the phone today is to make more people aware yeah. that we can get it and go and check it out. So all the men who are listening now, put your hand on your breast and feel uh, if there's any lumps. I'm having a little feel now. Yeah, I'm right. Because we <laughs> we, we, we've come on such a long way. I'm... I, we, we, we now all know how to, the gentlemen to check ourselves downstairs. Yeah. I can't stop checking myself sometimes, Mike. Particularly <laughs> when it's cold like this. Yes. Uh, but yeah, you're right. It's just it, it's just thirty seconds, isn't it? Thirty yeah, seconds when you're in the show. And the one thing about it is, if you think about it, I think it was six weeks between um, me discovering it and it been out. Yeah. And that is an amazing service from the NHS. They were brilliant. Yeah, they are. That's and High Wycombe is a crack. My my mum went to High Wycombe for her breast it? cancer, and it's a cracking hospital and a cracking team there, isn't it? Yeah, really, really, so so impressed with it. And I've, um, as part of the operation, what they do is they check the um, lymph nodes. Yep. Um, to see whether the, that's the vehicle that spreads stuff yeah, around the body. Yeah, it goes there. And were your lymph nodes okay? Yes. Good lad. So, Mike, 
I'm clear, but the thing to remember yeah. is that if if you don't look at it, how much of the cancerous goes through the lymph nodes into other areas of the body and diagnosed as something else? Mike, it's so nice to talk to you. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing that because it's amazing the number of blokes that don't know you can get it. And fair play, he was told he had cancer, he went home and booked a trip to Mexico. Well done. I love that. I love that. Thank you, Mike. Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. On the M1 southbound, there are severe delays because of an accident just after Junction 10 for the Luton Airport Spur Road. That has been cleared after the road now and all the lanes have reopened there, but the queues are still from Junction 12 for Flitwick at the moment. We should hopefully see that start to ease off soon. Still problems on the A5 southbound. It's very heavy for people diverting from the M1 and but that's heavy between the A505 just north of Houghton Regis towards the M1 Junction 9 at Redbourne. On the M1 southbound as well, a bit further up between Junction 14 for Milton Keynes and 13 for Bedford. There's been another accident causing some queues and the M40 northbound is looking very slow at the moment between the Denham roundabout towards the M25. In Watford having a look at the speed sensors and Chalk Hill's very busy at the Bushy Arches. Samantha Bruff, BBC Three Counties Radio. Hey. A bit bruff around the edges but still. <laughs> no? No? Matt, do you want me to check downstairs for you, see if you're alright? I don't mind. Local and vocal across beds, hearts and bucks. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. It's eight o'clock, I'm Simon Oxley. The headlines, mental health nurses set to go on the beat in Bedfordshire. Milton Keynes Hospital criticised over A&E and Hitchin Singer wins a Brit Award. BBC Three Counties Radio. Mental health nurses are set to join Bedfordshire police officers on the beat. A quarter of all incidents handled by Beds Police involve someone with a mental health problem. Chief Inspector Jackie Whitred says her officers welcome the plans which are subject to funding. They really recognise the significant difference this could make to their day to day work. That 3am test, an officer turns up, they are the emergency service that's on duty. That is the point where we need that support and we accept that we need some support in making the right decision. Accident and emergency at Milton Keynes Hospital has received one of the worst ratings in the country by the health watchdog. The Care Quality Commission said the trust had to review its performance as a matter of urgency. The hospital say they've been doing a lot of work to improve patient experience in A&E, but Labour's Andrew Paik says they need government help. The cost of a new A&E is £21 million. Um, This week the Chancellor said he was looking at putting another £2 billion into the NHS. If the Chancellor himself says the money's there, I think a small slice of that cake should come to us to get that A&E built so that we're fit for purpose. Drivers on the M1 are facing long delays this morning following two accidents on the southbound carriageway. There have been lane closures in place between junctions 10 and 9 and in the last half hour a multi-vehicle accident has been reported between junctions 14 and 13. Police searching for a missing mother and her newborn baby have found a woman's body. Charlotte Bevan walked out of a hospital in Bristol on Tuesday evening. More from Nigel Dando. Last night, the search switched to an area beneath the city's Clifton Suspension Bridge and shortly afterwards, the police announced that they'd found the body of a woman in the Avon Gorge. The Avon and Somerset Force helicopter was used in the operation as officers continued a search of the area. But there's still no sign of baby Zani. The search for her continues today. Police said the family of 30-year-old Charlotte had been told of the discovery. Formal identification of the woman's body is due to take place later today. Seven people, including three children, were injured in a road crash in Milton Keynes last night. The emergency services were called to Watling Street in Bletchley near the junction with Wadden Way after a two-car collision at around 9.45. Firefighters had to release an injured man. Three women, two boys and a girl were also hurt. Hertfordshire singer-songwriter James Bay has landed the Critics' Choice Award at next year's Brit Awards, following the likes of Adele, Ellie Goulding and last year's winner Sam Smith. The 24-year-old from Hitchin will perform at the Brit's nomination party next month. In sport, leaders Chelsea have extended their unbeaten start in the Premier League to 14 matches, with a 3-0 win over Tottenham at Stamford Bridge. Second place Manchester City won 4 one at Sunderland. The weather cloudy with outbreaks of rain or drizzle and feeling cold, a maximum temperature just 6 degrees Celsius and you can get the latest news and sport online at bbc.co.uk slash three counties. 
Today on BBC Three Counties Radio. From nine. The JVS Show. With your views, your stories and your consumer problems. From 12. Nick Coffer. Ellis Jones is a sixth form student from Luton. She's turned her life around with the help of local charity Youthscape. And together they've designed some Christmas cards with a difference. From three. Roberto Peroni. With the best local news and the best local travel. Followed by the politics panel. It's easy for you to say. Mark Forrest. I'll bring you the best bits from everything that's been happening right, on Mark, BBC Local Radio. We made Today, those best bits. on BBC Three Counties Radio. We made those best bits. We did the tricky bit. Not you. You're just playing them, innit? There are bits. Yeah. Stop playing with my bits, Forrest. <laughs> Stop playing with my bits in the forest, Mark. Well... Hey. Morning, guys. Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. The show has perked up today, hasn't it? Uh, so, can uh, 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 oh, being overweight, is it an addiction? Is food an addictive thing? Can you become addicted to overeating? I think you can. I know you can. I know you can because I've spoken to people about this. I've spoken to uh, uh, psychologists and therapists and people who suffer from this addiction. I know it's an addiction. An addiction is when you cannot stop doing something. It's always a feeling that hole in your soul. If gambling can be an addiction, and we've pretty much... We all know that gambling is an addiction. Well, then why can't food be an addiction? You're right, it's filling that hole. It's trying to fill a void. It's covering up for shame and low self-esteem. You do something, you feel better for a bit, and then you feel shameful about that, so you carry on doing it. And for the people who don't believe in it, I wonder what they do to treat themselves, because you know that that's the, that's the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and do you wear pyjamas in bed? 08459 four double five five double five. It's... Across beds, hearts and bucks. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. I know you've got some texts. Yeah. I've got an email from Jill, who Jill generally sends in spot-on emails, i.e. she agrees with me, <laughs> is what I mean. Uh, I argue that Justin is wrong about eating not being addictive. I know a woman who ate chocolate cake out of a bin after her child's birthday party. <gasps> She felt so ashamed but was addicted to chocolate. Anyone can become addicted to anything if they get pleasure from it and the brain gets happy endorphins. Justin is young and needs to read more. That way, well, that's never going to happen. That way, he would have a better general knowledge and be less likely to make sweeping statements he has little knowledge of. He's entitled... I, 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 love, having, I love Justin on the show. He's kind of one, of one of our many secret weapons. Have you got some texts? Yeah, and the thing is with Justin as well, you know exactly what he's thinking. He's going to be yeah. completely honest oh, with you. Yeah. And he doesn't really... He's brilliant. He, he doesn't say anything to please anybody else. No. Uh, with hilarious consequences. <laughs> I believe food can be addictive, says Julian Luton. I once tried to cut out sugar from my fairly unhealthy diet. After a couple of days, I became dizzy, nauseous and feverish, almost yeah. like withdrawing from a drug. As soon as I had something sugary, I felt better. Uh, Richard from Luton says, I'm a 24 stone man and an ex-smoker. Justin, the drug addict, has made my blood boil. Oh. His addiction to smoking can be treated and stopped because I know I've done it. There's currently no help for my eating disorder other than just being told to exercise or eat less. I try and I fail, just like the addict who doesn't take the medication. Look, look up Overeaters Anonymous. OA. They'll help. They'll uh, help. And Helen Milton Keynes, as a former 50 or 60 day smoker who gave up overnight, I could say that Justin could easily stop if he wanted to. However, I understand that for some people, they find it harder to stop. I know someone who exercises daily, eats fish and vegetable, uh, vegetables, but is still classed as overweight as she stops smoking and the weight piled on. Justin should open his mind to addictions and the various forms. It doesn't just apply to smoking. I, I think you can pretty much be addicted to anything that makes you feel better. You can be addicted to video games, you can be addicted to shopping, you can be addicted to, uh, to sex, you can be addicted to food, you can be addicted to drink, all of these things. If it changes the way you feel about yourself, uh, then you can be addicted to it. Oh, yeah, I'm borderline shopping. Yeah. I know if I've had a bad day because oh. I find myself online looking for something very, very particular. I, I know because if, you, if I know you're having a rough day and then the next day you'll come and say, oh, I bought two dresses online. And it's, it's that kind of thing. It's filling that void. 08459 455 555 is the telephone number. I've got very crackly headphones today. Who would have thought... A BBC uh, radio station, not having uh, the equipment that was required. Lots of you talking on Facebook about this as well. Um, oh, here's a good one. Simon says, uh, nope, it's not addictive, none at all. It's self-inflicted. They're just greedy. They eat heaps of the wrong things, know what they're doing is wrong, and will make them ill or even die, but they still do it. Um, and let's do one more of these. I was given... Uh, uh, so it's quite a long one. I was given 12 weeks of vouchers for Weight Watchers or Slimming World for free for the NHS due to my being overweight. Um, weight loss is possible if you want it enough. 08459 455 555 is the phone number. 
across beds, hearts and bucks. This is Ian Lee. BBC Three Counties Radio. Now, a quarter of all incidents that Bedfordshire Police are called to involve someone with a mental health problem, which is why they are trying a new approach. As part of a host of new measures, they're hoping to get the funding necessary to take mental health nurses out on the beat. We're joined now by Ben Sammons. Uh, uh, morning, Ben. Thanks for joining us. Hello. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself. You, you, you uh, have a, a mental condition. Yeah, um, I was diagnosed with depression and paranoid psychosis. OK, and how does that manifest itself? How does that affect you? How, how has that affected you in the past? Um, I mean, it, it can get incredibly sort of severe to the point of suicide, which um, is in, incredibly sort of difficult to, to sort of cope with. And, um, and just sort of things in kind of everyday life, really, yeah. is sort of to the point of where even if you're sort of going food shopping and becoming incredibly paranoid about people that are there, yeah. and then it just becomes so kind of difficult if you think someone's laughing at you, then you then worry about that, and you think someone else is, and it just... So it can trigger off a chain of, of feelings and emotions. If, you, yeah. if one thing kind of hits you, then suddenly everyone else is, is, a, is a potential enemy. Yeah, it just makes you, yeah, it is incredibly kind of frightening. So you've had dealings with the police. Yeah. Because of your... B- b- because of your mental health issues, um, what yeah. happened? Um, basically, I tried to commit suicide. Um, this was a few years ago, and um, I'd gone down to the railway line, and um, I did manage to kind of call for help, and they ended up calling the police. You're going to jump in front of a train? Is, yeah, is the plan? I, yeah. I just did absolutely couldn't cope anymore. Yeah, and um, yeah, the, the police that sort of came, they sort of took me to hospital, and that experience, it wasn't too good with them kind of thing but then i've had experience we had four dealings with them and tell us well, tell us about that one so so you 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 went down to jump in front of a train you fo- phoned a friend and said uh, no i phoned the crisis team phoned a crisis team and said look i'm i am at my wits end here i'm desperate can you help mm. yeah basically and what happened so how many coppers turned up um well when they a couple came down onto the sort of railway line yeah. and sort of took me to a hospital right and I, I was absolutely petrified kind of thing and when when we got to the hospital i ran away from the police because i was just so scared because they were police um no just because i was just so scared about being put in in hospital right, okay. and the experience i had with them then was when i sort of they'd caught up with me and took take me back to the hospital was the officer said to me if you do that again i'll, I'll have you on the floor and in a cell and so that just ramped up my sort of feelings but then I was sectioned a second time, and yeah. the police were absolutely amazing. Okay, so what was the difference the second time then? How how did they, th- they manage to make it a better experience? If, um, if, if being sectioned could ever be a, a good no, experience, no, it's, um, no, it's not not nice at all. But they were just so compassionate, and I was in an incredibly difficult sort of state. And yeah, they were just incredibly compassionate and very calm with me, and helped sort of calm me down. And the difference between some an officer being hostile and one or two sort of being incredibly compassionate, it, it helps you so much because mm. what you're going through is just it's absolutely horrific. It's not their job, is it, to, to kind of be... They're not nurses, they're not doctors. Uh, no, and I don't think they should expect it to be that because um, that's not their job. The mental health nurses, it's, that's their job to kind of sort of help mm. look after. And I think it's, it's unfair to expect the police to be mental health nurses. It's just to kind of hope that they would have compassion to kind of help you in that situation and get you to that place of safety. And so, uh, can I ask what was happening that, that, that got you sectioned why, why, and how the police got involved in that scenario? Um, well, the second time, um, I'd become very paranoid about a situation and when I get very paranoid and you start to believe things that aren't hap- yeah, really yeah. happening. And again, I just I couldn't deal with it and... Again, with my problems, I do become very sort of suicidal. And I'd gone down to the railway line that time, but I, I couldn't go through with it. Mm. And I was coming back kind of thing, and the police sort of saw me sort of wandering back um, home, and that's when they sort of stopped and and helped. And as I say, I mean, they were so mm. helpful that time. I'm just incredibly grateful to them. It's, uh, it, it sounds like you, had, you, know, that you, you managed to get... Well, can I ask, were they men or women? I'm wondering if, if their gender makes a difference at all. Um, no, not at all. No, it doesn't. Um, no. No, I mean, the second time it was two, two males. Right, OK. Um, but, say, they, 
the way they handled it was, um, yeah, incredibly... So you must be supporting this initiative then to try and uh, get funding to, to, to get mental health, health nurses out on the beat, just to kind of... Uh, well, why would it be beneficial, in your opinion? Um, I think because they they sort of will understand it. And as I was saying before, the police shouldn't be expected to mm. to do that role. And um, But I think the benefit of it is that if someone is in crisis, but maybe if the uh, mental health nurse can intervene, then maybe taking them home could be a better option or taking them to hospital and they can kind of assess how, how someone is and they'll have that kind of understanding... I get terrified if I get pulled over in my car by a cop or if a copper comes up. It's kind of just that, that thing. I was always brought up to be respectful and a little bit fearful of the police. Mm. And I imagine if you are in a heightened state, for mm. whatever reason, that that can, that can really magnify the intensity of the situation. Yeah, I mean, one time I was taken into A&E and being flanked by two police officers, you think, oh, it, it, it's awful. <laughs> you think people are kind of viewing you as, as a criminal kind of thing and except you're, you're unwell. Mm. And, and it, yeah, it's a very, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's not. How, nice. how you doing now, Ben? You're right. Yeah, I'm. I'm doing all right at the moment, yeah. and, and that's the thing. I kind of I'm up and down quite a lot of the time. So sort of times when I'm feeling good, it's sort of trying to make the most of yeah. feeling good. Yeah, it's really nice to talk to you. Oh, thank I you appreciate very much. you coming in and uh, you know being quite honest. It's weird, isn't it? Because um, the, we were saying earlier on, people are still reluctant to talk about mental illness and uh you know i've suffered from depression in the past and i've had friends oh don't talk about that why do you want to talk mm-hmm. keep that quiet keep that secret but it's kind of, it's still a bit of a stigma around it isn't it yeah and i think being open about it and, and this is something that i really hope people can so in the future be sort of mm. open about it and, and access support and get sort of help mm. um with what they're sort of struggling with really nice to meet you ben thank you for coming cool. in oh thank you oh eight four five nine see that wasn't painful was it you see, you see? <laughs> i told you would be all right oh eight four five nine four double five five double five let's get the travel Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. There is still long queues on the M1 southbound after the accident earlier, just after Junction 10 for the Luton Airport Spur Road. Those queues are from Junction 12 for Flitwick at the moment. It's also causing problems on the A5 southbound. It's very heavy from the A505 to the M1 Junction 9 at Redbourne. And also on Airport Way, it's very slow joining the M1 southbound at there as well. From to around the Kidneywood roundabout, it's looking particularly busy at the moment on the speed sensors. Having a look at the M1 southbound between Junction 14 for Milton Keynes and 13 for Bedford. That's looking very busy after the accident there earlier run involving four vehicles that has been cleared out of the way but it is still queuing. On the M40 northbound it's very slow from the Denham roundabout towards the M25 and in Fenny Stratford on Watling Street there's reports that the traffic lights are out and that's causing queues between the McDonald's roundabout and the High Street. On the trains London Midland have a replacement bus service running between Watford Junction and St Holborn's Abbey. That's for engineering works that will be going on until the end of the month. Samantha Bruff, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you so much Samantha. 16. Oh, I gulped down far too much air then. 8.16. It is uh, th- th- Thursday, the 4th of December. I'm Ian Lee. These are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio. Nurses trained in mental health issues are set to be deployed alongside Bedfordshire police officers. Accident and emergency at Milton Keynes Hospital has received one of the worst ratings in the country. And police searching for a mother who disappeared from a maternity ward in Bristol with her newborn daughter, you, uh, newborn daughter have found a woman's body. BBC Three Counties Radio. Right. Well, let me know. Can I show you the headphones? We just throw them away with a pair of headphones. Look at these. Look at these. We're expected no. to let a guest use these. They're held together with sticky tape. Right. I know it's ridiculous. You you know we're on air, don't you? What? We're on air. Hey, morning, JVS. <laughs> so I'm so sorry. Morning, JVS. A little bit of bants. Yeah. Uh, you're looking great. Nice hair. You smell oh, nice. Usual thank, bants. Thanks very much. I like your pink shirt. Thank you. I'm on Radio 4 tonight. I thought I'd dress up. I saw your tweet earlier. What's going on? Why I'm are you on Radio 4? I'm on Front Row, the arts programme. Gosh. Me. I'll, t- I'll do it properly. I won't be like this rubbish. I'll do it properly. I was going to say, don't use your no. common voice, will you? No, no. I'll be doing my very best Radio 4 voice. I found... Oh. I thought the casting in this uh, movie was was excellent. The, the set pieces were wonderful. Overall, a really good film. I'd give it two thumbs up. Is that, is that what you're... Is that the voice you're going to use? I've never heard the programme before, so I'm guessing that's kind of... <laughs> The level, isn't it? That's kind of the level that they like. Yes. I give it two thumbs up. Just talk softly yes. and as if you're very thoughtful. 
I think the way the women were portrayed in this movie mm. was um, was very forward thinking. That's excellent. That's okay. Yeah, I, I I think you can get away with this as long as you're don't don't do that whole kind of you know calling the presenter boss or any of that kind of business because I don't think that would go down very well at Radio Four. Samira Ahmed, you are boss. <laughs> <laughs> I just pwned you, or whatever you call it. Did you? No, no, no. I, I'm saying don't, don't say, say that. Can I sing? Should I be singing Christmas time? La 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 la. No, That's don't do that. that. Please don't do that. Sing that on Radio Four. No, don't do that. Should I? Don't sing it on the BBC Three Counties Radio. Oh, I've got an idea. What? Should I say? I mean, should, give me a rude word to say. Give me a rude word to say. Oh, like, like that, like that politician. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking about cockerels. Yeah. Um, um, uh, balls. Okay. What? I'll say bums. No, no don't say you bums. can't. That's too obvious. You can't slip that no, into the conversation. I was listening to Radio Four the other day. They had the c word on at half past two in the afternoon what? in a play. <laughs> Flipping heck! Can you believe it? No. What's on your show this morning? Uh, coming up on the big phone in this morning, we're we're discussing this. I love this story. The yeah. the Devon oh, obese yeah. people and smokers story. Mm. I'll be asking from nine. Should very fat people and smokers be denied surgery on the NHS? Smokers and morbidly obese people in Devon will be denied routine surgery unless they quit smoking or lose weight. Patients with a BMI of thirty five or above will have to shed five percent of their body weight, while smokers will have to quit. Eight weeks before surgery, Dr. Tim Burke, who chairs New Devon CQC, has told the BBC that he knows it will be hard for people to lose weight and stop smoking, but they'll do whatever they can to help them. Well, from nine this morning, I'd like us to continue this debate. Should very fat people and smokers be denied surgery on the NHS? 08459 four double five five double five. Every weekday from 12, Nick Coffer brings you... The wickedly funny Anne on, on Strictly Come Dancing. <laughs> do, do you know who the real Anne is? Great guests. Yes, the real Anne is an amalgam of all these things. We're all multifaceted. Jasper Carrot's career spans five decades. And then you had to wear a bow tie and you had to do jokes about silly Irishmen and, and, and mother-in-laws. John Cleese is eating his Microphone, aren't you, John? Please. Mm. Great music. Ow! Da -da 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 -ba 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 -da -da -da. In fact, I don't even think it had the horn part then. Great conversations. I always have said throughout my career, you know, you get me on board, I'll give you a hundred percent. Have you still got it, Billy Ocean? Well, the audience seems to think I have. Nick Coffer, weekdays from twelve on BBC Three Counties Radio. What's Matt Lockwood doing? Who's he texting? Are you texting, Matt? You don't need to put your headphones. I'm just sorting something out to do with a guest that we just had. So uh, behind the scenes stuff. Okay. Well, that's that's good to good to yeah, know. Yeah. Is everything I all right? Cross everything today. Actually, uh, but, 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 does it sound all right to you? No. Well, well does it? I thought one I day, isn't it? Okay. Just one day. I sound like I'm across everything, don't I? There's been no. Okay, you're sorting uh, out via text. That's not very professional. There's been no hiccups, has there? Well. Uh, no, weather's gone out on time. Headlines, you've had your headlines. I've put stuff, stuff on Facebook. I mean, that's what Kelly does, doesn't she? Yes. Every day. I mean, what else does she do? Well, make sure, no make sure, make sure I've made you a drink. Meaningless waffle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got any texts, Catherine? Yeah, probably. Let's have a look. Yes, I have. Oh, you want me to read them? Yes, please. Okay, let's go for Thank it. Thank you so much. Uh, morning, Ian. Pajam morning. Pajamas. My son was five when my partner moved in with us. The first question my son asked: What colour are your pajamas? I don't have any. What? Oh, says my son. So months later, when we went to parent-teacher evening, the teacher greeted us and said to my partner, I've heard a lot about you. You don't have any pyjamas. Oi! Ha, 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 says I. She says, and you don't wear a nighty in bed anymore. What? Talk about embarrassed. The, yeah. Soon well in Garden City. Uh, look at... Uh, it, Nudie I, Sue. Nudie Sue. Nudie Sudi. Um, and Nick, food isn't addictive. It's the sugar within it that's addictive. It makes the food highly palatable and then f therefore easy okay. to consume. You may be able to sit and eat four bars of chocolate, but could you eat three pounds of carrots or a dozen eggs yeah. in one sitting? Yeah. No, because it's not that palatable. When you quit sugar, you hit the dip where you crave it for some weeks in certain cases, much like giving up smoking. It's two different things here. Yes, yeah. sugar is addictive, but but overeating is, is an addictive thing in itself, regardless of what it is you're it's eating. eating not the food that they're addicted to, the sensation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Well, we already heard from a woman who, who fished out a, um, a chocolate cake from the bin to eat it. That ain't normal behaviour. No. You know, that is something else is compelling you. But the shame that goes along with it is the thing that, that pushes you on. Uh, it, it's, it's funny, I, again, you know, I, I, I lived in Ponzi, London for a while and, you know, I work in the media, so I kind of thought everyone was, was, was aware of all these, these things, male breast cancer and a food addiction and stuff, and it turns out they're... Uh, they're not, but they, it's real. Liam's in London. Morning, Liam. Good morning. How what, are you? I'm good, thank you. What would you like to say? 
Um, basically, I was going to talk on the food subject. I was going to say that food, some foods are, are addictive to eat because there's actually chemicals and drugs that are put in them that are made them addictive for us. Well, well, the, okay, but, but which which foods are addictive, like chocolates and stuff? It's, no, it's like everything. Everything that is like fattening and bad for you, even any frozen food, any basically processed food. Frozen peas all, are addictive. Maybe not peas, but things that are made got stuff in preservatives and stuff like that in. A hundred percent, I've got all addictive drugs and chemicals in there. What kind of drugs are in there? I, I can't get the names off the top of my head, but I've done a lot of research. I don't know if you've watched the documentary. On the internet? It's, it's called no. It's off a documentary called Food Matters. Okay, right. And I've I've also done um, obviously research on the internet and yeah. a, a nutritionist. I've kind of got in contact with them and talked to them about it. So what do you eat then, Liam? I eat, I eat normal food, but the fact is that it is addictive to eat. It's, it's some so people you're that eat. you're addicted. Um, yeah, you could say that, yeah, but I'm not overweight. No. But I still I can agree with the fact that foods can be addictive it's, to eat. We, 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 I think we are, we're, we're, we're doing two different issues. at the start. Yes, I think some foods are addictive, and yes, sugar is addictive, and you, you, you're yeah, possibly yeah. right that there are chemicals and E-numbers that, that, that we kind of, once we've had them, we crave them a bit more. But the process of eating itself is an addiction. I, I, yeah, it can be, yeah. I reckon it can be also a thing of boredom yeah. or... Again, like you say, an addiction where people just do it as a habit. Liam, thank you very much indeed. It seems we've, got, we've, we've established that certain foods can be addictive. Of course chocolate's addictive. It's, a chemi- it's got chemicals in. It's got sugar in. But it's the process of eating that's addictive. So the question is, do you have any sympathy for overweight people? Any sympathy at all? We, I don't buy, we don't buy the fat bones, big bones things anymore. That's rubbish, isn't it? Uh, 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 and yes, some people may have a problem with the thyroid and some people may just be lazy, but there are a significant number of people that cannot stop eating. They eat because they don't like themselves or they feel shameful about something. The food is them taking control of a situation and um, thereby they feel empowered and maybe they feel better about themselves. It gives them a rush. Then they have the come down where they feel more shame because well, what they've done, they've lost control. They, look, they think they look ugly and so they keep eating and eating and eating. Same with drugs, same with booze, same with cigarettes. 08459 four double five five double five. Talking about mental health and how uh, Bedfordshire Police are hoping to try and get some money, some funding, so they can take mental health nurses out with them. Kiri's in Luton. Good morning, Kiri. Hi, good morning, Ian. Kiri, what Hi. would you like to say? Um, first of all, can I just say one thing before I tell you that, because it is about my son. Um, it's my 40th birthday today, and my son's listening, um, in the car with my husband, because they're doing a school run today, so I just wanted to tell them how much I love them first, before... You, You couldn't tell them in person? Well, I did. I told okay. them before they went out. Okay, but... good. As long as you tell, as long as you tell them, it's, it's nice to hear on the radio. It's nice to hear it face to face. Well, well done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, with regard to the mental health, um, my son um, is eleven and he has Asperger's, yep. um, which is a form of autism, um, and. I've seen it from both sides of as a child, and also my best friend's got a son who's now an adult. And if and you ha- and when you're a child, you you can get the support out there. Um, there's um, my son when he was little had to go be referred to mental health because he used to self harm when he was very young, like smashing his head and hurting himself. Oh blimey! And yeah, and um, and at the, and as long as you work with the schools and and that they see that they're not that he's not just a naughty child and that he does have problems because at one stage years ago before it was diagnosed that you were just a naughty child and you ended up just at the back of the class. Whereas now there is the support there. How do you because there are there are uh, 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 there are children who are just naughty, aren't there? How, how oh, do you yes. differentiate between how do you diagnose that your son? has Asperger's as opposed to being naughty child? How does that happen? Um, I suppose it was just um, seeing that I've got two children and seeing how different he was and also just that the, the, the remorse that he had when he did something wrong. I mean, we've had times where it's, I mean, he's trashed my house, he's smashed everything, he's kicked us, bitten us when he was younger. But how do you know that that, that wasn't just <laughs> naughtiness, that is Asperger's? Um... 
Hmm. <laughs> um, I don't know. I just suppose that that there are that he can be very good, and that he and that the remorse that he has, and it's just I suppose I mean for him, he doesn't have any social so, social interaction with children. He doesn't understand right. how how everything's on his terms, not on anyone else's terms. Yeah. And I suppose not being able to get on with your peers makes it. And I suppose that's how you notice it. And and I mean, he used to be medicated, but mm. I don't. But I don't medicate him anymore. So has he been, my... he's been he's been diagnosed by a doctor, has he? Oh yeah, when he was four. Yeah, four. Yeah, he. Yeah, four years old. There was something wrong from day one with him. Yeah. yeah. He was diagnosed by four. He has a full statement with his school. So what did it say at four, then? What did the doctor say was wrong with him at four? Um, that just the way he, he was... It was literally like Jekyll and Hyde. Like, he could go from being such a good boy to suddenly... Everything just, it was like it went black for him. And, I mean, the things that he did were just unimaginable at the time. Yeah. And But as I said, at the time, I medicated him, whereas now I don't. And that's, not, that's, that's, that's different, because I've got a four-year-old boy, and um, so one minute he's fine and we're having a laugh, the next minute he's punching me in the ghoulies and he's going nuts. Yeah, but this would go on for hours. I mean, right. we could have three hours of my house okay. being completely trashed. But can I just say one thing that with regards to the medication, yeah. that I don't medicate him anymore because he's got to learn to live in the real world and learn for him he can cope without it because he's got to be part of society and I don't okay. let him hide behind who he is. Kiri, thank you very much indeed. Oh, d- nice to talk to Kiri there. I was, um, I, I tell you what, I was holding back slightly from some of my questions because I knew that her, her lab was listening in the car. So it didn't seem fair to um, to push too hard. I, the lab was listening in the car, so I didn't want to... Uh... Yeah. All right. How do you diagnose a four-year-old with having a disorder? How do you diagnose a four-year-old? Because, hey, you know, four-year-olds, they're really, really good. And they're really, really naughty. They're four-year-olds. My boy is uh, can be an angel. He can also be a right little sh- so-and-so. You know, he can... He, 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 they're four. Yeah, Medicating good. four-year-olds. Wow. But, um, gosh, there's so much there that's got me um, thinking. All right, what is it? I and do think... And I don't want to make this just about Kiri. No, not at all. So let's... You're right, you're right. Thank you. Let's move away slightly from Kiri because, uh, say, the boy's listening and it's her birthday and I don't want to make it about her. And I'm sure their situation is is completely as described. But there there is, um, I think, a massive overdiagnosis of kids with with mental disorders or being on various spectrums. Um, And uh, when sometimes, you know what? Kids are just naughty. Sometimes kids are just naughty. But at the same time, I know that some kids aren't just being naughty and it's a great the awareness of these the awareness of these disabilities the awareness of these conditions needs to be raised because the parents get an awful lot of flack for the way their children behave here we, here we go we've got to go to travel in a second we can talk about this for the last half an hour the overdiagnosis of uh, mental health conditions in children because conspiracy theorist time but boy oh boy don't drugs companies make a lot of money uh, by prescribing drugs to children because then they've got them for the whole of their life and also again not talking about Kiri now this is now just in general isn't it a great get out clause for parents of unruly children oh that Tommy is such a little so and so yes well he's on a spectrum not saying that's all of them but isn't it a great get out clause Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. On the M1 southbound, it's still queuing between Junction 12 for Flitwick and 10 for the Luton Airport Spur Road. That's because of the accident involving three cars that has been cleared, still causing long delays. Also causing problems on the A5 southbound between Leighton Road now and the M1 Junction 9 for Redbourne. In On the M1 southbound, a bit further up on Junction 14 for Milton Keynes, between there and Junction 13 for Bedford. That has also been an accident there that's causing some queues. In Fenny Stratford on Watling Street, there's reports that it's queuing because the traffic lights are out between the McDonald's roundabout and the High Street. They're stuck on red there. And in Milton Keynes on the A421 Standing Way, it's queuing eastbound between Tassenhoe Lane around the Windmill Roundabout and Watling Street. Having a look at the A1 southbound, it's queuing between the Kimbleton turnoff and around the Black Cat Roundabout through those roadworks and on the train 
Lines. London Midland have a replacement bus service running between Watford Junction and St Albans Abbey, and that's for ongoing engineering works. Samantha Braff, BBC Three Counties Radio. The phone, thank you, Samantha. The phones seem to have gone, uh, I was to say mental, it's probably inappropriate with what we're talking about. Um, but uh, if you're trying to call, do keep trying. The phone will be answered eventually. And we'll talk about ZX Spectrums. Oh, I'm going to get so geeky. After the news. Across beds, hearts, and bugs. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. With the headlines, I'm Simon Oxley. Mental health nurses are set to join Bedfordshire police officers on the beat. A quarter of all incidents handled by Beds Police involve someone with a mental health problem. Police searching for a mother who disappeared from a, from a maternity ward in Bristol with her newborn daughter have found a woman's body about two miles away. The baby is still missing. Accident and emergency at Milton Keynes Hospital has received one of the worst ratings in the country by the health watchdog. The Care Quality Commission said the Trust had to review its performance as a matter of Emergency. And Hitchin singer-songwriter James Bay has landed the Critics' Choice Award at next year's Brit Awards, following the likes of Adele, Ellie Goulding and last year's winner Sam Smith. Three Counties Sports. BBC Three Counties Radio. Chelsea remain six points clear at the top of the Premier League after a 3-0 win at home to Tottenham. Second place Manchester City won 4-1 at Sunderland. Arsenal beat Southampton 1-0 with a last-minute goal from Alexis Sanchez, his manager Arsene Wenger. Well, it was a difficult game against a good side, but overall I think we deserved to win. It was a victory of uh, patience, intelligence, and uh, we kept our structure well. And overall, uh, it is an important win against a good side. And also last night, Everton and Hull drew one all. Luton have sold their extra allocation for the Boxing Day trip to Wickham, meaning over 2,600 Hatters fans will be at Adams Park. And Luton's home game with Portsmouth two days later is also now a sellout. England's cricketers won the rain-affected third one-day international in Sri Lanka by five wickets under the Duckworth-Lewis method. They now trail 2-1 in the seven-match series. But Captain Alistair Cook is facing a suspension if England are found guilty of a slow overrate. It's incredibly hard when you only play one spinner and also you can see how big the ground is the batters take quite a long time to come out but we knew that coming in we we try to be as quick as you can but we probably were a little bit slow today Um, I don't know what the punishment will be or if there is any there will be a record 21 Formula One races next year compared to 19 this year the Korean Grand Prix returns with a new race in Mexico the British Grand Prix at Silverstone is on July the 5th and a report out this morning says the Tour de France's visit to the UK this summer was watched by 4.8 million people and generated around £128 million. BBC Three Counties News and Sports, the next full bulletin is at nine. Across beds, hearts and bucks. This is Ian Lee. BBC Three Counties Radio. Morning, guys. So, lot to talk about. Is uh, uh, overeating an addiction? Do you wear pyjamas? And the overdiagnosis of mental health issues in children? Who'd have thought it? But before that, allow my inner geek to get excited. Catherine, what computer did you have? As I had a ZX Spectrum. Did you have the Spectrum? Yeah, but mine, um, mine was different from that one. Mine had a tape on it. Mine, I you had a, you had a ZX Spectrum Plus Two. Yeah. In that case, if you had the t- the tape was built onto it. Yeah, it was yeah, Plus yeah. Two. What did you have, uh, lockers? Uh, Commodore C sixty four with a cartridge in the back and the the cassettes that used to take forever to yeah. load. Yeah. Uh, I had a Dragon thirty two. Then I, that was replaced by a BBC Micro because it was educational. Then I got a Nintendo, like a little grey box uh, with cartridges. They got silly, the games got silly then. Uh, ZX Spectrum was... It was, it was Sir, the bomb. Sir Clive Sinclair invented it. With the, uh, the, uh, the, he was branded a fool for saying every home can have its own personal computer. Yeah, all right, you nut job. Oh, look where we are now. Um, well, the ZX Spectrum is making a comeback. Thank you to Paul Andrews from Retro Computers. Morning, Paul. Good morning, Ian. Uh, you're based at the Hat Factory in Luton. That's correct. And this popped up on my Facebook timeline yesterday, which is how I was, became aware of this project. It shows the uh, new technology clashing with the old. You're bringing... Well, you're bringing a variation of the Spectrum back. What's going on? Well, basically, we, it's taken 15 years, but finally we bought a version of the Spectrum back, which is a handheld console. <sighs> Man alive, this is just so sexy. It's the Spectr- ZX Spectrum Vega, isn't it? That's correct. Uh, why, first of all, why have you done this? Well, basically, uh, it's been, as I say, a 15-year journey, personally. But um, there, there is a demand. There's lots of people, like yourself, who seem very excited about it. 
Uh, and so this is going to be a handheld thing. Will it plug into the TV? How's it, how's it going to work? Yeah, it's going to plug straight into your TV. Um, first version will use a HDMI cable to power it and a input into the TV. So uh, it will be work on most new current TVs as well. And it's going to have a thousand games, a thousand games already loaded onto it. That's correct, yeah. We're, we're busy working with all the rights holders to uh, get a 1,000 games, and all the profits from the games are going to go to Great Ormond Street Hospital. This is great, because I know that people have kind of d- attempted to do similar projects in the past, and uh, it, some of the, the, um, the, the people who wrote the games were a little bit funny about it being used. Are, are you, are you meet, meeting any resistance from the copyright holders, or are they all um, pretty much up no, for it? No, I would, I would say 90% of the people we spoke to so far are really uh, behind the project. Scott, I have, Scott keeps messaging me on Twitter. He wants to know is Minder going to be on there? <laughs> I'm not sure about that one just yet. <laughs> <laughs> how do you pick, how do you pick the game? I mean, are you all kind of just picking your your favourite games? What well, g- give us some of the titles that will be on there? Well, we're hoping to get some of the ultimate games on there, but that's not confirmed yet. But obviously, they're quite big ones. If you remember, Panic Attack, Saber Wolf. Uh, You're gonna have Saber Wolf. Yeah, yeah. We're talking to those people. Um, we're talking, we should have their school days on it. That's a big favourite. And Saber Turn. Cass just got well excited. Yes! That's my (laughs) Uh, game. Good. Nothing's confirmed just yet till we do the final line-up, but it's it's all looking very promising. Um, And it it does... it, It sort of looks like a spectrum, but it doesn't, does it? Describe it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's quite small, relatively, compared to the old Spectrum. We, we've tried to keep the shape, the basic shape. We've got permission to do that. Uh, and it's obviously got all the keys it needs. But it's also got a virtual keyboard, so you can play games as well. Right, and is it going to have the tape-loading effect? You, you've got to have that <laughs> on there somewhere, dude. We're going to do something with it. Now, th- you're, you're, this is one of those um, crowdsourcing things. When I looked at it yesterday, you had something like £79,000. Yeah. I looked at it today, you're over 100000 Yeah, you were up to about 111000 it's, it's, We've been totally blown away by the support of people. Uh, yeah. So, if you sign up now, you don't... Because I didn't sign up yesterday like an idiot, so I've got to sign up today. <laughs> and I, so I won't get one of the first batch, but I'll no. get one of the second batch. That's correct, yeah. We've we tried to make it as fair as possible. We didn't want to, obviously... Uh, make too many from the first batch. We want to make it quite exclusive. But you can sign up and reserve one now. So if I signed up now, which I'm going to do, what, what, yeah. uh, when would I get my uh, Spectrum Vega? That'll be probably two months after April. You get the opportunity. So ju- that's that's, that's, that's June, June, I believe. Have yeah, you got, yeah. Listen, you're just around the... Come on, let's, let's cut to the chase, mate. You're yeah. just around the corner from us. Have you got a working yeah. model? Can I come and play on it? Not today, <sighs> but we do have... But in the near future, yes. <sighs> Paul. You're more, you're more than welcome to come and try it. Paul, you've got my email, haven't you? Yes. Yeah, when, yeah. when you have a working model, I'm going to sign up today because I love this. Uh, but when you've got a working model, let me know and I'll come and have a little play and we, we'll, yeah, we'll do another little piece on the air. People Excellent. want to find out more, Paul. Where do they go? How can they, how can they get involved with in this? Uh, the easiest thing to do to find the link is to go to our website first, which is retro-computers.co.uk. And the links are all there. I'm, I'm guessing you're about 43. Uh, not far off. Yeah, because <laughs> we're of that kind of age. It's that like middle-aged yeah. men. It's the equivalent of like my my granddad or something having a train set. It's that kind of thing, it isn't is. it? It is. It is. I so say everyone is so excited. We say so we can't say how uh, you know blown away we are by the support of everyone. And, and, and uh, Sinclair's involved, isn't he? He's giving it the yeah. thumbs up, which is which is kind of unusual because it, when it when it first became a gaming computer, he tried to stop people writing games yeah. for it. He didn't he want did, them yeah. to write games for it. <laughs> what a no, dumb. no. No, no, he's, he's, he's really behind the project. He's, uh, he's doing interviews for the television today. It's, Brilliant. It's, the whole thing's just moving forward. Oh, uh, listen, it, 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 seriously keep in touch, because this stuff gets me very, very excited. Okay, and um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep the, the listener informed as to how the project's going. Brilliant, thanks for that. Paul, thank you very much indeed. Sabotage! <laughs> I can just about remember how you get past the dog. I'm so excited. Right, so I'm so excited. Right, thank you for that, Paul. There's ZX Spectrum Vega, and we'll, we'll keep you up to date. And it's happening in Luton as well. It's just around the corner from us. How cool is that? Very. 08459 oh, 555 is uh, overeating. Can it be an addiction? Do you have any sympathy for overeaters? Well, we'll do the Facebook comments in a bit because there's quite a few. Uh, and also, we spoke to uh, Kiri. Uh, about her young son who was diagnosed with Asperger's at, uh, of four. Uh, and and um, while I'm sure that's all a completely legitimate situation that they're dealing with, I do worry that, that there is an over-diagnosis um, um, of, of young children with mental illnesses. It's, it, a, it makes the drug companies a load, load of money. Listen to me sounding like Russell Brand. And B, isn't it convenient for the parents who've got just naughty little so-and-sos? Oh, yeah, well, he's on a spec. Tommy's on a spectrum. You see, he, he, spectrums again. Tom, Tommy's got um, uh, ADHD. There's a syndrome called, I can't remember what it's called, it's something like 
um, uh, uh, doesn't like being spoken to syndrome or something. And it's if you tell a kid to do something and they won't do it, that can be diagnosed as something. Mm. Andrew's in Letchworth. Morning, Andrew. Good morning, Ian. How are we? I'm all right, thanks, boss. What you got? I completely agree with you as far as this overdiagnosis in children's concerned. I think it's absolutely tied in with the times today. A few years, you know, years back, you kick your parents, my parents would have given us a good smack and that would have been the end of it. Um, but obviously now there's a lot more skill involved and needed as far as the way that you talk to your children to, to you know, handle them. So there's a lot of psychological in there. If you're lacking the ability to do that, then it's easy to label it and just say, it's, it's less embarrassing, isn't it? Do you, do you think, it. Andrew, that any of these diagnoses in, in children can be accurate? 100%, yes. 100%. There's definitely some. Um, but I, I, honestly, I'll, I, I, it's probably as high as 60% in my mind uh, are inaccurate. I don't know how you diagnose a three- or four-year-old with having a behavioural disorder because three- and four-year-olds are completely random. And, you know, I, I, I say the wrong thing to my boy... When I when I heard your little girl's hummus the other day, she, she overreacted re- somewhat. Didn't she, she got really upset. You know, it, it's 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 kids are unpredictable. Yeah, but there are certain signposts. You know, a friend of mine's uh, son is is um, on the autistic spectrum, and you can tell that there is something not quite connecting there. Uh, in a yeah, different yeah. way from other children, you know. Yeah. He's not interested in doing anything to please anybody else. Yeah, that's not different from most toddlers. But there is an... It, it's more pronounced in some way, you know. He, he really... You know, it's the eye contact, it's the conversations you have with him. You're not really having a conversation. He's having a monologue. Andrew, thank you for that. 08459 four double five five double five. And we're not... D- 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 people will be hearing what they want to hear and they'll exactly. now be parents going, well, hang on. Well, my yeah. little girl has got... The, how dare you say that she's not got it? We've got one here from Anna. If you're a radio presenter, not a medical authority, if a doctor and a parent have made a diagnosis, knowing the child, who are you to question it? Not questioning it. I, I, well, I, well, I am a little bit, but I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not denying these things exist. We're allowed to talk about it, aren't we? Yeah, of course we are, because I am a parent. I'm allowed to talk about uh, mental health issues in children. I'm a human being, I'm allowed to talk about it. Um, th- and there will be parents going, well yeah, well, yeah, but my little Sophie, has, how dare he say she's not got ADHD? How dare he say she's not... You're not saying that? not saying that at all. I'm just saying I, there is probably... It's it's easy it's easy to diagnose something than say well actually do you know what maybe this kid is just naughty and we're not doing something right as parents and in this case we're not talking about a doctor's diagnosis we're talking about parents yeah. having read things deciding that that fits oh eight four five nine four double five five double five let's get the travel travel news for beds hearts and bugs BBC Three Counties Radio. There are still problems on the M1 southbound. It's queuing between Junction 12 for Flittick and 10 for the Luton Airport Spur Road after an accident. And that's also causing queues on the A5 southbound between Leighton Road and the M1 Junction 9 at Redbourne. On the M1 southbound as well between Junction 14 for Milton Keynes and 13 for Bedford, there are long delays there because of another accident. And that's also causing problems in Newport Pagnell on the London Road there. It's queuing in both directions between the Tickford roundabout and the M1 Junction 14 at Milton Keynes. In Fanny Stratford on Watling Street, there's reports that the traffic lights there are stuck on red between the McDonald's roundabout and the High Street. And in Milton Keynes, the A421 Standing Way is queuing eastbound between the Windmill Hill roundabout and Watling Street. Samantha Bruff, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Samantha. 8.46, Thursday the 4th of December. I'm Ian Lee. These are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio. Nurses trained in mental health issues are set to be deployed alongside Bedfordshire police officers. Accident and emergency at Milton Keynes Hospital has received one of the worst ratings in the country by the health watchdog. And police searching for a mother who disappeared from a maternity ward in Bristol with her newborn daughter have found a woman's body. More of your calls coming up and the great pyjama debate rages on. But before that, here's the weather with Alina. Beds, hearts and bucks weather. BBC Three Counties Radio. Ian, good morning to you. It's a cold start this morning. It's going to stay cold through the day. Quite a raw feel, plenty of cloud around, a bit of light rain and drizzle at times, but not really amounting to much. A high of 5 Celsius, that's 41 degrees Fahrenheit. Still cloudy tonight, some light rain or drizzle at times. Again, not much to it, bringing some damp rather than overly wet conditions. With all the cloud around, it'll keep temperatures above freezing at around 1 Celsius, 34 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Still cloudy tomorrow morning, perhaps a brief bit of brightness for a time, but generally the cloud will win and again it will bring some light rain and drizzle around mid to late morning. But through the afternoon, something drier and brighter, some late sunshine to be found, highs of 6 Celsius. And as we keep clear skies overnight into Saturday, Saturday will be a cold and frosty start, but then a crisp winter's day with plenty of sunshine. BBC Three Counties Radio, I'm Alina Jenkins. Every weekday morning. You can book your place on the show now. Jonathan Vernon Smith. Come on and get some help, get some assistance. Tackling your consumer problems. I couldn't trace an account in any of the names, any of the addresses that were given. For it to be running for six weeks and then for them to cut it all off again just doesn't make any sense. The JVS show fights for your rights. He came to me and asked if I could go and have a word with said bank. I had an email from the bank to say that you'd been in touch with them and the senior customs relations manager was most apologetic. Thankfully, you managed to get your money back. Yep, but that was due to, obviously, your station itself. The JVS Show, weekdays from nine on BBC Three Counties Radio. 08459 four double five five double five. Have you got any texts? Yeah, I've got quite a few. Catherine, it's been busy this morning, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, this one's from Mark in Bedford. I'm an ex-primary school teacher. It's true, there are a lot of children diagnosed with conditions. Some may be incorrect, but that's not to say that all diagnoses are questionable. Some children do have a need for help. I was in a petrol station and a child who obviously had a condition was playing up. As soon as his exasperated mother took him out of the station, people started saying that he needed a clip round the ear. But no one dared say it in front of his mother. As I pointed out to them at the time... Idiots. Isn't this interesting? It, 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 apart from the pyjamas, it all kind... And the spectrum... Well, the spectrum... No, apart from the pyjamas, it all kinds of, kind of links up today. The talking uh, about the mental health of the police, over-diagnosis of conditions in young people, and uh, the, the, whether overeating uh, is an addiction. There's a f- loads of comments on, on Facebook. Let me just pick two at random. Uh, Lisa says, overeating is a psychological problem. It's too easy just to tell people to stop eating so much, but to some people, food is a drug. Food can be a comfort, a reward, or a friend to some. To break the cycle, you need to look at the way you approach food and eating and rewire your brain. It's no different to smoking or drinking, in my opinion. Uh, And one that we read earlier, uh, there's loads of comments on here. Thank you so much for some really good personal stories. Well, they all get read. We had uh, a text on that one as well from on. Stephen Bedford. I can't help but think that those people who say just stop eating are the same as people who say cheer up, pull your socks up when talking about depression. Okay, um... Pull your socks up, mate. But then there are some people who don't think you can be addicted to drugs or alcohol. You know, there are some people who think, it, well, just stop. It's your, you shouldn't have taken drugs in the first place. Yes, yeah, but at a certain point, it doesn't look like fun anymore. No. Um, Pippa's in Luton. Good morning, Pippa. Good morning. What have you got for us, Pippa? Um, my daughter was diagnosed um, with an eating disorder when she was about 10, 11 years old. Mm. Um, and it was a big struggle for us to get the support we needed. Um, we obviously approached certain organisations, the NHS, the doctor, um, and it was a bit of a disaster. We almost had a complete family bust up because it caused such arguments. Oh. Um, we actually resolved the problem ourselves. What, what were you um, arguing the about? Um, the questioning that we were put under, the strain that we were put under as a family to go through. Yeah. They were trying to delve into hidden issues and hidden problems. And oh, so they, OK, they were trying to blame you. Absolutely. Yeah. Conflicting, conflicting pieces of advice from the paediatric dietitian. So but she was, she was, di- it was your daughter, wasn't it? Sorry. Yes. She yes. was diagnosed by a doctor, but then the doctor wouldn't give help. She, she wasn't really diagnosed. It took a long time for the doctors to understand that she had a disorder in the first place. Yeah. And I think they probably thought I had Munchausen's by proxy, the way I was going on about it. Um, we finally got to the NHS. We we had various appointments with paediatric dietitians who gave us two complete, completely conflicting pieces of advice, yeah. which made the matters a lot worse. Um, we then um, managed to approach an organisation and we started quite lengthy um, family meetings together, together with my daughter. Um, and I think they were probably trying to delve down into what the problem was or why she wasn't eating. And we would leave those meetings absolutely hating each other. Gosh. It was, it was terrible. Um, then we had another organisation that helped us because they thought that maybe it was due to bereavement because she'd lost both her grandparents. Um, that caused even more problems. Um, you know, and, and basically we resolved it ourselves just by backing off, not putting pressure on her. Yeah. Um, you know, and sort of allowing her to have breakfast only twice a week rather than forcing her or or making her have breakfast every day type of thing 
um, she's now a healthy 16-year-old with the whole world as a worcester. But we just felt that all the support and all the help we had was a little bit misguided and it didn't work for us. Um, I'm trying to draw a conclusion from this, paper, and I don't quite know what conclusion I'm trying to draw. It's a difficult one, all I would yeah. say, because obviously I have family and friends who have had to go down the same kind of route. Um, I don't think it's for everybody in terms of that maybe the services that are helping need to understand a lot more um, and talk a lot more rather than trying to pinpoint a fault or a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I just found that by backing off from all of that and backing off as a family and not putting pressure on her to eat, um, we managed to resolve it. It took three, four years, um, you know, but it worked for us not having all the support in the end. Pippa, um, and that, no, I mean, I'm not suggesting that for everyone, no, but no, that's no, what no, everyone, Everyone's kind of mental health uh, the, the journey is, is a different... It's different for everybody, isn't it? So what uh, will work for one will not work for others. Pippa, thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, so interesting, isn't it? That's one of the things I really worry about as a mother of uh, two girls, because I saw it a lot when I was a teenager. Eating disorders, and yeah. so hard to know how to react. Well, e- well, do you know what? Even with boys now, because uh, you you just have to be so careful about those. Oh, you're leaving that. Finish up your supper. No pudding until you. Fa- you got, Don't eat all those sweets. You'll get fat. Yeah, you've got to be so careful with how you phrase things. Of course, it's a bigger concern for girl, for parents of girls. Of course, it is. But but I think it's also a yeah, concern for us. I, I find so. myself telling my mum off for saying stuff that that might encourage yeah. them to question what they're eating. I certainly notice a lot more of those sort of comments coming from my mum and dad's generation. And, and it's done with affection and love and a little bit of a gentle ribbing as far as they're concerned. But I'm always really careful about body image, really careful. This is why I love this show. Because we're going from talking about uh, eating disorders to Justin Dealey not wearing pyjamas. And there's no, there's, no, there's, no, there's, no link. there's no easy way of doing it, Justin. No. And you just kind of have to cl- crunch the gears mm. and move on. And that's why it's, and this is why but I like hey. the listeners, because they'll, they'll tol- most of them will tolerate this. Come on, great calls this morning. But also, that's why the programme, I have to say, to give you a little pat on the back occasionally, Here Here that's why it's award-winning, because you go. never quite know what's going to come next, do you? Yeah, exactly. Mm. It's, and it's all, it's all down to me. No, not quite. Sorry. <laughs> now, Justin, were you, I bet, I, we just talked to the, the fella about ZX Spectrums. I bet you were never a computer person, were you? No. You were, you were a sportsman, yeah. Yeah, I loved my football. When I was younger, all my friends were into computer games. I absolutely hated them. For me, I wanted to go down to the Old Town record shop and buy some seven-inch singles. That, for me, was playtime. You could still play records and play computer games. No, it just, it never, ever interests me. And even now, you know, loads of moments, oh, come round, we're, we're going to play all these games. You must be joking. I prefer to sit at home. <laughs> and listen to Phil Collins' No Jacket Required oh, I'd for love the 500th that. time. I'd love that. As a grown woman, I mean, mm. as a girl, it was difficult to get invited around to those evenings, but I loved them. But no one ever asked me anymore. I know why people don't ask you. I bet you're a button basher. I'm a button basher. You're yeah. a button basher. <laughs> don't be bitter about it. I'll still beat you. Justin. Yeah. Pajamas. Yeah, you've got issues. Uh, <laughs> I wear pajamas. You don't. You sleep in the nude. Listen, uh, if you look on the internet and you Google you, okay, that there's some pretty, <laughs> Sorry, there's, there's some pretty <laughs> dodgy photographs in there, but in the flesh, you're not a bad-looking bloke, but but you're letting yourself down here. Why are you wearing pyjamas in bed? It's not sexy. Man. I know what Come the answer on. to this is, Justin, and it will happen to you one day. When you've got kids, yeah. you've got to keep it covered. Yeah, but you can still be sexy if you've got children. I don't get that. When they climb into bed with you and jump it all over you, you want to make sure that you're, uh, if you're listen, decent. If lock the door. If you're in the bedroom lock with the missus, lock the door and sleep naked. I don't want. I don't want to lock the kid, kids. Wander in at night. So they have coughing fits in the middle of the night. Can yeah. you imagine that towering over them? Mm, okay. Can I help you out with that? So no. If, Could if you put you, some pants on? If you went away for a romantic weekend, would you still wear the PJs, boss? Yes. Oh, do you know why? No, so do you know wrong. why? Yeah. I like the mystery. I like the mystery of the PJs. <laughs> I don't want. I don't like. You know. I don't like naked women. <laughs> oh, really. <laughs> I like, them, I like them clothed because I like the mystery. OK. Fair enough. Anyway, yeah. you've taken this to the streets, Justin. Yeah. I'm sure everyone's agreed with me, so thanks very much for doing that. Yeah, I've been asking people this morning, do you wear pyjamas in bed? Some uh, very strong views on this one. Um, here's what the men had to say. How are you, sir? Fine, thank you, sir. Yeah, not bad. Do you wear gym jams in bed? No, I do not. <laughs> Why not? Because I'm a man. What's your advice to men listening to this right now who go to bed day in, day out wearing pyjamas? Be a man. Paul, do you wear gym jams in bed? No. What do you think about men who do? Be honest. 
bit weird, really. Uh, no, I don't. That's a very personal question. It's very personal. Why don't you wear pyjamas in bed? Because it's not sexy? Yeah, my boyfriend doesn't uh, like me wearing pyjamas. Morning, boss. What's your name? Brandon. Do you wear pyjamas in bed? Yes. Why? Because you're letting men down. Why are you doing that? Because it's more comfortable, I believe. Yeah, but you're not sexy, are you? No, I'm not. Do you not want to be sexy? Yeah, I do. So why are you wearing pyjamas? Because nobody else sees them. Well, you haven't got a girlfriend? No. OK, if you had a girlfriend, would you then drop the pyjamas? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you would. You would have to drop the pyjamas, wouldn't you? Just get them in the mood. So, you're from Sweden. Fantastic. Let's get the European view on this. Do you wear gym jams in bed? Pyjamas? No, I don't. Tell me why you don't. Because I don't find it comfortable. If you went to bed this evening wearing pyjamas, you wouldn't be the same Swedish man that you are, would you? <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I tell you what, Just. I tell you what. I just had an insight into Matt that I don't need. Go on. No, 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 it's fine. I, um, last night I found this hidden away, and I'm going to get it out tonight. <laughs> my wee willy winky. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm going to get my Hats. wee willy winky out. Yeah, the little hat. And I love wearing a nightshirt. Yeah. I'm going to wear my nightshirt tonight and my wee willy winky. You go and do that, but uh, you won't be sexy. Just know that, all right? I'm going to take a picture and I'm going to send it to you, and you are going to want to come round and uh, kiss me all over, and I'm not going to let you. No, no thank chance. Bye. Thank, thank you very much indeed. On that erotic bombshell. <laughs> Probably best we end the show, innit? Thank <laughs> you very much. Travel news for beds, cards, and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. There are still problems on the M1 southbound all the way from Junction 14 for Milton Keynes to Junction 10 for the Luton Airport Spur Road. So after two accidents, one at Junction 14 and one near Junction 10, causing it to be very slow. But there's also problems on the A5 southbound with severe delays because of those accidents between Leighton Road and the M1 Junction 9 for Redbourne. In Newport Pagnell on London Road, it's queuing in both directions between the Tickford roundabout and Milton Keynes, not helped by those problems on the M1. And in Dunstable, Skimpot Road, it's queuing because of two accidents that have happened between Dunstable Road and and Church Street that's causing long queues in the area as well with a lorry partially blocking the roundabout. And having a look at the train side reports of any problems there at the moment, Samantha Braff, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Samantha. Excellent stuff as always. Really good calls this morning. Thank you. I like it when it's like that. It makes my job easier. Right, I'm off to go and buy myself a Spectrum. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Justin. Thank you as always, Catherine Boyle. We'll be back tomorrow at six. JVS next. Ta-ta. Local and vocal across beds, hearts and bucks. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Ian. Good morning. Welcome to the JVS Show. I'm Jonathan Vernon-Smith. It's Thursday. It's nine o'clock. And on today's big phone-in, should very fat people and smokers be denied surgery on the NHS? Smokers and morbidly obese people in 